Warning. This story contains scenes and scenarios which may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Over the past three months, some very weird and frankly terrifying things have happened to me. I'm writing this diary or log of events tonight for fear that after I do what I plan to do, I may never come home. I want this to be proof or maybe some clue to what has happened to me if someone finds this. If I didn't make it back and you are reading this right now, wondering where I am, please, for your own good, do not come looking for me. But before I get ahead of myself, I should start at the beginning where my life took an eventful and horrifying turn for the worst. Entry 1. A Stroll in the Woods Hello, my name is Cameron, and I'm an insomniac. I have been for as long as I can remember. In the grand scheme of things, it is horrible, it really is, but I do enjoy some things. I like to try my best to see the silver lining. For instance, my nighttime walks in the woods near my house. I live in the Highlands in Scotland in a small town called Avamore. It has a population of just over 3,000 and is smack bang in the middle of nowhere. Although it's very popular for tourists and skiing holidays, there isn't much, but it's nice and quiet and I love it. Especially the dark, dark nights. I love looking at the sky and being able to see everything clearly. And of course, the Aurora Borealis is very frequent this far north. Most nights, when I can't sleep, I like to go out and walk. I live in the more northwestern area of town, so literally five to ten minutes' walk from my front porch is seemingly endless forestry and fields, as far as the eye can see. It's always so peaceful and relaxing. So about fifteen or twenty minutes' walk from my house, there is a caravan and camping park called Oakwood, Sometimes I make the three or four minute drive and park there instead, so I can miss out on the town part of the walk, just in case I run into anyone. I like my walks to be lonely. I don't have the time nor the inclination to talk to a drunk neighbor returning home from the local pub. That being said, this is where my current favorite trail begins. It is not a long walk. It really could be done keeping to the trails in about 25 minutes, but I like to wander in and out the tree line and through some of the thick woods. It usually takes me about 45 minutes as I take in the surroundings, the calm of the forest, the rustling of the gentle breeze to the leaves, the moonlight bobbing in and out of sight as it dances to the treetops to light the way for me. And sometimes those gaps in the trees give way to some of the most incredible greens and purples and reds gliding across the sky so elegantly, like the brush of an artist painting the most incredible scenery in the night sky. The then trail opens out and ends at a beautiful little lake, called A.V. Lockham. I love to sit on the bank and watch the light from the sky roll across the surface of the lake and listen to the water gently tumbling onto the shore while I just sit in peace and collect my thoughts. Usually I'll sit there for maybe an hour. Sometimes I'll walk around the lake and skip stones or just lie on the cool, soft grass and stare back in time at the stars and galaxies that fill the night before heading back the way I came. I don't do this every night. There are other great trails, too, and other things I like to do with my spare nights when I can't get much sleep. I have many stories to share, but for this entry I'd like to tell you about something that happened on the very walk I love so much. This is where it all started. Usually between around 1 and 2 a.m., I wake up. And the first thing I notice is that it's pitch black outside, and then how quiet everything is, or isn't, weather dependent. Then I turn to check the time on my phone, knowing exactly what to expect, but ever hopeful that one day it will just say 5.33 a.m. or 6.21 a.m. at any slightly more normal time to wake up. I awoke, looked out the window, and said it was quiet this night. Dark, early winter, so dark, dark, and a little cold, but not more than I could handle on a daily basis. I checked my phone. 1.08 a.m. I lay under my covers with my eyes closed for about twenty minutes, failing miserably at getting back to sleep. At this point, I'd begun to hear a slow whispering breeze on the other side of my window. It was so calming and inviting, I knew I was walking tonight. I quickly sat up and began picking my clothes up off the floor and got dressed. 
I walked down my hallway and opened the door. I shut it again instantly. A jacket. It was colder than I had expected, so I walked to the back of my hallway and got my big hiking jacket. It was a good warm one. I stuck a beanie hat on and made my way into the garden. It was a nice, fresh night. The moon was fat and bright over me, and a slow, icy breeze caressed my cheeks. I hopped in my car and backed out of the driveway. The streets seemed to be dead, but it wasn't a chance I was willing to take tonight. I've come across people before, and it always somewhat spoils the atmosphere. A drunk neighbor or friend on the way home talking shit for thirty minutes while I politely stand and listen, secretly regretting ever leaving the house. Tonight, I will drive. I drove up to the entrance of Oakwood and parked my car. I took some cigarettes, a lighter, my phone, and a bottle of water. There was a small serrated sports knife in the car, but I'd never actually taken it with me before. Never had to, and tonight was no exception. As I got out of the car, I felt that fresh air hit my lungs. There were a few voices coming from the camping area, but they would be out of earshot soon enough. Aside from that, the only noise was the breeze rustling the bushes and trees. Since I can park inside the grounds and the best trail actually sets off from inside the park, you can park up near the entrance and walk through. From here you walk north and come to a trail and set off up there. You're immediately flanked by woods on both sides as you leave the campground, and it is this trail that leads directly to the lake. The trees are not very thick near the beginning, so around the first five minutes into the walk I normally stick to the trail. Nothing out of the ordinary. There's actually quite a lot to explore around this part. There are a number of little clearances in the thick parts of the woods. I actually had to find them on Google Maps, because you can't see from the trail. There are very few little paths leading to them. I like to approach them as the wood gets thicker and the sky disappears to then burst through the tree line and be bathed in moonlight. The sky seems so small when you look up from the middle of a clearance in the woods. It's something you really have to experience for yourself. The best ones are in the woods to the left. To the right, there's actually not much, and it's only a short distance through to a road, although I still wander through that way too, which is where I was when I heard a noise behind me. It sounded like something falling into a pile of leaves. I stopped in my tracks. I waited, being as quiet as I could. It's not uncommon for things to fall out of trees, or even to hear a twig snap or a rustling now and again from some animal or whatever, but something about this just struck me like it fell as if there was just something not right about it. I kept looking around and being as still and quiet as I could. It was extremely dark, so I had the feeling that, unlikely as it was, if it was a person, I couldn't see them, so I was confident they couldn't see me. I waited a few minutes, maybe five, before I felt comfortable taking another step. There were no other standout noises, so I just chalked it up to my sleep-deprived imagination. I made my way to the trail again. I knew I was almost at the clearing in the woods on the other side, so I wanted to head over to that area. Now I want to mention here that in about seven or eight years of walking at night, not only this trail, but multiple woods and trails nearby my town at this time of night, I had never once ran into another person outside of the town. But fuck me. As I approached the trail just before I revealed myself for the night sky, there was a fucking guy walking down the opposite way away from the lake towards the camping ground. I stopped and crouched down and just observed him, feeling safe that he hadn't seemed to notice me, and I was obscured by about three layers of trees. He walked calmly and without hesitation, as if he knew this area as well as I did, but as he got closer, I knew I had never seen this man before. His face was gaunt and expressionless. His clothes looked a little rough, but he was dressed pretty smart, like he was wearing a suit that hadn't been taken care of for years. He walked right past me, looking nowhere but straight forward. I didn't make a sound. I just watched. Honestly, I was a bit scared, but we were only about 15 minutes from a campsite, so maybe he was staying there and decided to go for a 2 a.m. walk in a battered old suit alone. It's the only explanation I could think of, to be honest. Whatever the reason, I did not want to come face to face with this random guy I've never even seen before at 2 a.m. in the woods. I knew that much. I waited until he was pretty much completely out of sight, and I hastily skipped over to the other side, making sure I held up for a few minutes when I got there to see if he had either noticed me or turned back or anything. He didn't, thankfully, 
but it still creeps the hell out of me. I turned back to the direction of the lake, taking myself through the woods. I was almost at the first clearing. I like to call it the spider. It's kind of almost circular shape, with small trails leading off its edges in all directions. Kind of like legs. I don't know. I thought it was a cool name. I could see the tree line approaching, and I couldn't wait to get a view of the sky from it. I tried picking up the pace a little, but the wood gets quite thick as you get closer, so it's not easy. There was a dead silence. The only sound was the crunching of leaves and twigs under my boots. Even the breeze had died. It was actually quite eerie, but in a way I kind of liked that. I could feel adrenaline beginning to pump through my veins. As I set foot on the soft grass of the spider clearing, there was now absolutely no sound. No breeze, no leaves or twigs, no animals or critters. Only deafening silence, as I took a few more steps toward the middle. The moon wasn't exactly in the right place to shine in and light the area up as it sometimes does, so it was dark. Very dark. I could still see to some extent. There was light spilling in from the edges, but not much. I could still see the tree line all around me, but it wasn't such that I could make out individual trees. I could only recognize it as a dark wall surrounding the clearing. I craned my neck to look directly upward at the sky. The stars shone so bright as they seemed to float inside the most beautiful deep blue and purple ocean in the sky, with a smoky cloud that haze formed behind them, as if it was about to swallow them all whole. I could honestly stare at it forever. Excuse me. I literally jumped back and let out a gasp of terror as I saw a pale-faced, frail old man standing right in front of me. Excuse me, sir, he repeated in his high-pitched, shaky voice. I stared at the frail old man, unable to say a word. His white, crooked face seemed to emanate its own light, as did his whitish, wrinkled hands. The rest of his body was as dark as the tree line on the other side. It was almost as if it was swallowing any available lights that met it. I just stared in disbelief. What was I seeing here? Was I hallucinating? Excuse me, young man. The old man's shaky voice repeated as he took a step towards me. I took a step back. Uh, who are you? I inquired, fear so evident in my tone. I was hoping you could help me. Please. The old man grumbled as he took another wobbly step forward. I took another step back. I'm, I'm sorry, mister. I really need to get going. I said, as I took yet another step back toward the trees. Son, I'm lost and cold. I need to find my way back to my wife. Her name is Loretta. Have you seen her? I need to find her. She's out here somewhere. Look, mister, I haven't seen any Loretta or anybody around here at all. It's 3 a.m. and there's nobody back here. We're in the woods. I stopped for a second. Wait. Are you from the camping grounds at Oakwood? Camping ground? He replied. Yeah, the campground just back there. I turned my head towards Oakwood. There's a trail. It's only about a 15 or 20 minute walk by... As I turned my head back to face the old man, you would not believe what I saw. I couldn't even believe in my own sanity. It couldn't be. It was impossible. As I turned back around, I saw nothing. The old man was gone. Completely gone. Nowhere in the clearing to be seen at all. I must have been hallucinating. It had to be that. There's no other explanation. But I didn't feel weird in any way, or sleep deprived, or even tired. Plus, it was so real. There was no way it was a hallucination, but how could that be possible? Nothing like this had ever happened to me before. I was too scared to move. I dropped to my knees. My legs had turned weak, and sheer terror took over me after what I had just witnessed. I tried to reason with myself. It had to be my imagination. That's where the old man somehow ran into the darkness. It was only a few seconds my gaze had left him, so it didn't seem possible. But there just had to be some kind of explanation. I slowly got back to my feet, looking all around, desperately trying to see something. Anything. I couldn't. I decided maybe I'll stick to the main open trail, stay out of the woods until I get to the lake, and also the trail gets me there faster. I could see a pale green tint in the sky, 
The aurora had come tonight, and I didn't want to miss it. As I walked back through the tree line heading for the trail, I just had a feeling there were eyes on me from all directions. At some points, I actually thought I could see eyes through the trees. Several eyes. Glowing whites, but only for a split second. Some of them I thought I saw were red. That creeped me out, but they were just in my periphery, and when I would turn to check, there was always nothing there. I just wanted to get to the trail as fast as possible. I made it pretty quickly, aside from stumbling on a few rocks and fallen branches. The trail opened up in front of me, and I was less than ten minutes from the lake. I picked up the pace. I felt like if I made it there, I could just forget about all the weird stuff and watch the sky, relax, and then take the fastest route back to my car. A very long and brisk five-minute walk later, I had the lake in my sights. I could see the moonlight bouncing off the surface, shimmering like a beacon of white flame. I broke into a jog and made it there in a minute or two. The breeze had picked up again, and I could hear the rustling of leaves along with the smooth lapping of water against the bank. The aurora was lighting up the sky in a deep shade of purple, with a green rim, and the stars were bursting through like a huge city in the sky. I began to walk around the bank, taking in the fresh air, every couple of minutes stopping, feeling the air on my face and enjoying the calm. About ten minutes later, I was just about to head back when I noticed something in the water. It was just up ahead, a kind of dark mass. It looked like maybe a suitcase covered in reeds and mud. I found myself getting closer, not letting it out of my sight, as it bobbed freely and smoothly along the surface, nearing the edge. As I got closer, it started to take on a more recognizable form. As I saw at one end of the mass, hair. It was the back of someone's head. A person was floating face down in this freezing lake. Their matted black hair tangled with dirt and slimy weeds running all across their back intertwining. Their clothes seemed like they used to be either a pale yellow or green, now dark and mucky, stained with a deep red near the neck. As disrespectful as this might sound, I had to grab the person by the hair to drag them closer. It was as far as I could reach, although it was either that or leave them there. The long, slippery hair was sliding between my fingers as I struggled to grip, but managed to put them close enough to get my hands under their arms and drag them onto the land. I pulled the body about ten feet from the water. It wasn't easy. I flipped the poor soul over and discovered a bloated face with peeling skin. There were horrible little creatures crawling from orifice to orifice and scurrying all over their face and eyes. I studied the body. I saw it was a pale green dress, kind of like some old-school diner waitress. I almost threw up when I saw the huge, deep, clean wound across their neck. Bloodless, but the insides of the throat were completely exposed, and also cut through. The skull appeared dented, smashed in with some blunt object and I began to notice stab wounds all over the body. The legs, the stomach, the face, the chest. The chest. I noticed a name tag on the chest. I ran my thumb across the cold metal and revealed the name. Loretta. I jumped up. I felt sick. I felt like I was about to have a panic attack. Loretta. I kept seeing that name tag in my mind's eye. I heard the skipping sound again. I stopped. I stared as the ripples opened once again, as a stone skipped all the way towards me. I could feel my stomach turn as it skipped right up and jumped out of the water and landed at my feet. There was a lump in my throat. I picked it up and stared intently at it. My heart sank as that familiar feeling of dread consumed me. A whistle echoed from the other side of the lake. The light was much better here thanks to the unobscured moon, and as I looked up and across the lake, there he was. The old man. His chalk-white face was unmistakable, but he was taller, much taller, and he stared at me with his glowing, reddish eyes, smiling a toothy grin. He jumped in the water and disappeared beneath the surface. I started shaking in fear. My legs couldn't move. I wanted to bolt as fast as I could, but I was frozen. I heard a soft brush of grass behind me. Before I could turn around, I felt the slick, cold, wet hands wrap around my face, covering my mouth. 
The smell was unbearable, and it felt like the decomposing flesh was seeping into my mouth as I tried to scream. I was unable to turn my head just enough to see. Loretta. Her dead eyes stared right through me as if I didn't exist. She made no sound, and her grip tightened around my face. I looked forward to seeing the old man's head sticking out of the water just ten feet away. He was staring right at me, smiling and slowly rising above the surface. As he pulled himself from the water, he gave a very light but menacing laugh. Excuse me, did you help me find my wife? He growled as he laughed behind his words like a maniac. I was helpless. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I had to try and get out of there any way I could. I fought Loretta's grip, but she was unexpectedly strong. I tried kicking her behind me, but to no avail. Eventually, I let my legs give way completely. I dropped straight down like a dead weight to my ass and was able to slip through her watery grasp. As she clamored to grab me again, I was able to roll to the side and jump up as fast as I could. The old guy stopped and just stared as I ran back into the woods. Loretta stared too. Her blackened, puffy eyes seemed to train on my very being with laser precision as her dead gaze pierced my soul. I wasn't slowing down for fucking anything. I ran as fast as I could, never looking back. A fog began to descend on the forest as the air began to change. It became more difficult to see where I was going with every passing second as I ran. Something barged into me, or I barged into something. It was a body hanging from a tree, swinging violently as I screamed and got back to my feet. I sprinted once again through the trees when I saw more. Bodies everywhere I looked, swinging from the trees in the fog. I couldn't stop. I had to run through. Some of them made a grab at my hair and my jacket. I was crying now. My legs were getting weaker, and I could feel my body giving up. Help! I screamed in vain as my legs began to wobble. Somebody, please help! I broke through the trees, and I collapsed. I was on the trail. The fog was still getting thicker, but I knew I could make it back easier this way. When I saw a shadow slowly emerge from the cloud, I just lay on my front, sobbing. My legs had given up, and there was no fight left in me. I knew it was them. I knew I was probably going to die. Are you alright? Said an unfamiliar voice. I glanced over, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was the guy from earlier I saw walking the trail, still in his beautiful old shitty suit. That beautiful fucking bastard was back, and he was here to save me. I thanked all the gods I didn't believe in, and I sobbed even more. Please, help me. Please. I'm being chased. I'm being hunted. Hunted? The man said. Let me help you up. Sit over here on this stump and catch your breath. Maybe then we can get you back down to Oakwood once you've gotten your energy back. I couldn't believe my luck. I couldn't believe what was happening, and I was so happy I was safe. I actually felt safe. I sat on an old tree stump and let my legs regain feeling and let my energy replenish. What do you mean you're being hunted? And by who? Or by what? The man asked. It's a long story. You'd never believe it anyway. I'm, I'm not even sure if I do. You're welcome to try me. I'll keep an open mind. He reassured me, smiling warmly. Honestly... I don't even know where to begin, I said, as I stretched my leg out to keep it from cramping. I whimpered in pain. Careful there, buddy. Let yourself relax. You're obviously very tense if you've just gotten through a traumatic experience. I'll stay here with you. Don't worry however long it takes. I started to feel a whole lot better. He interrupted the quiet once again. So, what actually happened? And I'm confused as to why you wouldn't believe it yourself if it just happened moments ago. He asked me. Because it's just so far-fetched, I can't even trust my own mind anymore. I hesitantly replied, kicking my legs out again, finally able to feel something in them. Well, he said, putting his hand on the back of my neck. Sometimes things happen that are so out of this world, most people won't even believe a single word until it's staring them... Right in the face.
He began to growl as I felt his fingers elongate and tighten right around my neck. I turned my head and I was face to face with the most grotesquely evil looking pale face with the glowing deep red eyes of the hottest flame, his hot arid breath almost choking me. He began laughing maniacally and threw me to the ground and stood up. He was about eight feet in height and slim. His long pointed fingers danced around like a kid in a sweet shop picking out his favorite candies. His crooked legs began to stomp towards me. The adrenaline burst through my body like a shotgun shell, and I jumped so fast to my feet and sprinted like I never have before, screaming like a fucking lunatic the whole way, all the time hearing that horrible laughter like it was right by my ear. I almost burst through my car door as I made it back. I fumbled for my keys and jumped in, grabbing my knife and started the car, my wheels screeching as I took off at breakneck speed. I couldn't get home fast enough. I skidded the car to a halt in my driveway and legged it into the house. I couldn't even remember if I closed the car door. I switched on every light and sat in the middle of my lounge with my knife in my hand, and I waited. I sat in total silence for over an hour. Every little noise, every creak and general house noise that wasn't my thumping heartbeat sent a cold shiver down my spine. Only after I had managed to calm down did I feel comfortable moving from my spot. I could finally feel the tiredness begin to take over. It was around 5.30 a.m. Maybe it was safe to go and try to get some sleep. My body ached, and I was mentally and physically exhausted. I felt battered and bruised. I left every light on and cautiously walked up to my room. I made sure every window and every door was locked, and I lay in bed, still on edge but feeling so tired. The simple darkness outside my window struck fear into me. I didn't want to look, so I turned away from it. I would probably end up waiting until the sun came up before I could sleep. Although my eyes were very heavy, I couldn't decide if I was too scared or if it was even safe to sleep. As I lay in my bed under my cover, my mind raced. My eyes were opening and closing. My blinks got longer. Compared to earlier, I did feel a little better, but I didn't take away from the absolute terror that enveloped my every thought. My eyes were getting really, really heavy now. I knew the time was coming where I would have to give up fighting sleep and just let it take over. Feeling so sleepy, I thought I fell asleep for a minute or two, but I couldn't tell. It was time for me to drift off. My brain was shutting down from exhaustion. I can't be 100% sure, because I was on the threshold of dream and reality but I swear this felt as real as everything that had happened earlier. Just before my mind switched off, I heard something inside my room that still haunts me to this very moment after everything that's happened and will stay with me for the rest of my life. Excuse me. A shaky voice inquired. My eyes shot open. A night in. My eyes shot open. It couldn't have been real. I lay frozen in fear. All I wanted to do was sleep, but I was terrified now. Did I just hear that? I checked my phone. Almost 6 a.m. I sighed. It was beginning to get lighter outside, at least. It was still pretty dark, but dawn was fast approaching, and my ex-wife would be dropping Julian, my four-year-old son, off in two hours. I take him every Sunday and Tuesday and every second Saturday. I wish I could see him every day, but such is life, I guess. My ex-wife Linda left a couple of years ago because apparently I had become withdrawn. We barely spoke to each other and I suppose she was right. I had become withdrawn. I was disappearing a lot more often during my sleepless nights and for longer periods of time. I was never up to anything other than being a loner, but she probably had her suspicions too, so that didn't help. Anyway, I supposed I should just get up. I felt so groggy. I stumbled downstairs again, turning all the lights off and making myself a coffee. It was freezing. The kitchen window was wide open, so I shut it and turned the heating on. I put the TV on and had a quick look at the news headlines. Nothing interesting, so I started channel flicking. I was about halfway through my coffee when my stomach started to turn. The kitchen window. 
I made double, no, triple sure every single door and window was locked before I went upstairs to bed. Mental images from the previous night raced through my head. That skipping stone, that drowned woman, the guy's face. It made me shiver thinking about it. I went back upstairs after my coffee. There was nothing good on TV, as per usual, so I decided to make sure the spare room was ready for jewels. I changed the bedding and tidied up a little. They would be here soon. I had time for a quick shower and got myself ready, feeling a little more alive thanks to the coffee and shower. Three knocks on the door startled me, just as I walked past it. Hi, son, I said as I swung the door open. Nobody was there. Now I'm fucking freaked out again. I slammed the door shut, and instantly, three knocks rattled the inside of my head. It sounded like a bowling ball falling down some wooden stairs. I sat with my back to the door. Please, it's just stop. I whispered to myself. Three more knocks. I got to my feet, hesitantly. I unlatched the handle and slowly opened the door. My son's sweet little voice was like music to my ears. Jules, come and give me a hug, wee man. I said, delighted to see his face. I'm not so delighted to see the dagger look from Linda. What the hell was she pissed off about? Come on in. I said to both of them. Jules, go and get your toy box. Mom and Dad need to talk for a minute. Lisa gestured to the lounge where a box of Julian's toys were stored. She led me into the kitchen. What the fuck was all that about, Cameron? She snarled at me, getting right in my face. W what was that about? What do you mean? We were standing, waiting at the door for you, and you opened it, then slammed it in our fucking face. What the fuck are you on? Julian was frightened. You better not be on your fucking drugs, Cameron, because if you are, that's the last time you'll see him, I swear to fucking God. They were at the door. I couldn't have been more confused. There was definitely nobody there when I opened it. No time to think about it right now. Just say the right words and get the angry psycho out of my house. Think about it later. This really fucked with my head, though. No, Linda, I'm not on drugs for God's sake. I haven't slept much at all recently. I was just joking with the door thing. Like, a prank. But, I mean, I guess I look like death warmed up, but that's only because I haven't slept. I'm fine now. I had coffee and a shower, and I'm feeling good. I explained while I gently ushered her back into the hallway. Everything's fine, I promise. I added. I gave Jules a shout to come and say goodbye to his mom and quickly let her out the front door. When she had left, Jules was still playing with his toys. I just joined him in the lounge, and I slumped on the couch. Jules looked so happy playing with his cars and trucks. I put Nickelodeon on for Jules, and I lay down on the couch. I wasn't paying attention to the TV. I could only hear Jules playing, and my eyes were slowly getting heavier. Meow. Crash. Oops, purple cars crashed in a monster truck. Get the ambulance. Nina, Nina. Bless him. Julian continued. Come on, purple car. Let's get you to Gecko's garage. He'll fix you up. My eyes were getting heavier. I had tunnel vision, and Julian's voice was sounding more like an echo in my hollow head. Nina, Nina. Oh no, ambulance is stuck. Monster trucks are helping the ambulance. Brrr. Give me it back. No, give me it back. It's mine. Dad, he's taking my trucks. I sprang from the couch and panicked. What happened? Jules was visibly upset, but nothing was out of place. The stretchy man tried to take my monster truck, Jules said, more annoyed than fearful. I could feel that lump in my throat return. I felt sick. I was so tired. Okay, Jules, well he's gone now, so there's nothing to worry about. It was just your imagination, I said, while sitting him up on my knee. I don't think he's gone, Dad, Jules whispered. And we both heard two thumps from above us. I immediately ran upstairs, but all was quiet. There was nothing at all. Nothing out of place. No person or anything else. I checked under every bed, every wardrobe, behind every door. Nothing. I went back down to Jules. We should go out. Uh, grab a ball and some toys and we can go to the park. Jules jumped up. Yay, the park! He screamed as he grabbed some trucks and a football. 
We spent a few hours kicking the ball around and just messing around the park. We got some lunch, some sandwiches and chips, and we were leaving the cafeteria. I ran into a friend of my dad's, Big Joe. Or some called him Old Joe. Some called him the veteran. I don't even know how old this guy was, but he looked about a hundred when I was young. Anyway, the reason I was so glad to see him was that if you ever wanted to know anything about Aviemore, past or present, he always knew. He seems to know everything that had happened and all the latest town gossip. Joe, I said. It's been a while. How are you, old timer? Cammy, son. You're looking good. I've never been better. My God, is that Jules? You were just an ankle biter last time I saw you, wee man. He ruffled Julian's hair. He shied away behind me, peering at Joe with suspicion. Hey, he's getting bigger now. Starting school next year. I said with a proud look on my face. This is Joe. He was a friend of your granddad's, I explained to Jules as he continued to hide behind me. Anyway, Joe, I'm actually glad I ran into you. Something happened last night at A.V. Lockin. Something so insane I can't even describe it all right now. But I was wondering if I could bend your ear about it. Maybe tomorrow if you have the time. Joe's expression changed. He looked a sight more worried than pleased and now. Hey, uh, okay, Cammy? He stuttered and stumbled over his words. His voice fell to a whisper. Listen, make sure you come round to my house tomorrow, as soon as you drop Jules off. Come alone, as early as possible. I, uh, okay, no worries, Joe. I'll be there. I felt a bit freaked out by his response. He had a serious look of worry on his face and I was eager to find out what he knew. Joe hurried away without another word, so Jules and I started down the street. We were originally going to go see a movie, but there wasn't anything good in the cinema, so instead we went to a shop to look for a DVD to buy. We got popcorn, snacks, and some juice, and we got Toy Story 4 and Pinocchio. Secretly, Pinocchio was partly for me, too. It was my favorite Disney movie. Let's have a night in, a couple of movies and some snacks. I smiled at Jules as the shop assistant carefully packed our stuff in the bag. She smiled at Jules. Oh, Toy Story 4 is one of my favorites. Have you seen it? Jules shied away behind my leg again. No, we haven't seen it yet. Have you, son? I answered on his behalf, smiling back. Well, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. She let out a little laugh at Jules being shy. That'll be 3880. I handed over 40, and she gave me my change. Thank you very much, she said. Thank you, I replied, smiling. As I turned to head to the exit, I caught sight of her name tag. Hello, my name is Loretta. Happy to help, it read. My head felt dizzy, and I stumbled a step. Are you okay, sir? She asked as she put an arm out to steady me. I'm fine. I just... I looked at the name tag again. Hello, my name is Lorraine. Happy to help. I shook my head, and then stared for a moment in confusion. It's... it's nothing. I'm sorry. I just felt a bit dizzy. Jules looked at me, slightly worried. I took his hand and we walked quickly to the car. When I sat inside, I had to think for a few minutes. Did I imagine that? My head was spinning. Flashbacks from the night before were vivid in my mind. We got back home. It was around 4pm, so Jules had three or four hours until bedtime. Time enough to watch both movies, eat snacks, and get him bathed and ready for bed. Our night went without incidents. Aside from me almost falling asleep multiple times, we had a fantastic night. Just us two. Jules loved the movie, and so did I. I got him in his bed and started reading him a Dr. Seuss book. It was, what was I scared of? The one about the trousers with nobody inside them that chases the character around. He was sleeping before I was even halfway through, but I finished it anyway. I kind of enjoyed it. My big kid side was showing through tonight. I felt like I would be able to go and sleep pretty easily tonight. I could barely focus on the book. I was so tired. I went downstairs and got some water before returning to my bedroom. I lay in bed, eyes wide open, praying I would be able to sleep tonight. I checked Jules on the little camera, 
and he was out for it. My eyes once again closing on the brink of sleep. My body relaxed, and finally I switched off. The dreams took forever. It felt like I hadn't slept for weeks. I had a weird dream. I had got Jules a stretch arm thing toy for his birthday, and it went wild and started wrapping its arms around him hundreds of times, and I couldn't get it off. Eventually, it woke me up. I was in a cold sweat. I checked my clock. 1.22 a.m. It was actually quite depressing seeing that. I really felt like I was going to sleep right through the night. I just lay there, listening to the wind outside. I didn't want to look. I didn't want to move. No less than a minute later, I heard Julian screaming, a blood-curdling scream. I jolted out of bed and burst into his room. Dad! Dad! Dad, help! He screeched as he sat upright, crying his eyes out. The stretchy man said he was taking me away. My body felt weak. I felt absolutely helpless as he sat there physically shaking. I put my arms around him. It's okay, son. You can come and sleep in my bed. It was just a nightmare, I said, knowing to myself that something more sinister was definitely going on, but not wanting to admit it. I'm scared, Dad. He's not my friend. I think he's a bad man. I looked at him, sobbing, and I tried to comfort him. Okay. Okay, well, I'm here now, and I won't let him do anything. It was just a bad dream. I carried him to my bed, and I lay awake for several hours while he eventually slept beside me. I was on high alert. Everything had me on edge. I think I slept for another hour, maybe. Then my alarm went off. I had to get Julian ready for nursery. We had some toast for breakfast. I had a coffee, and I dropped him off at 7.45 a.m. I love you, son. Have fun today. I gave him a kiss on the head. Love you too, Dad. He shouted, already turning to run into his class. I had to get to Joe's ASAP. I wasn't sure if it was too early, but I figured I would drive by anyway and see if he was up. He did say as soon as I dropped Jules off, so surely he would still be waiting for me. I drove around. His house was about halfway down a dead-end street, so I drove past so I could turn around and park facing the way I would be leaving. As I drove past, I saw a large black transit van with a strange red W symbol on the side, parked just outside Joe's house. When I got to the end of the street, in my rear view, I saw a hooded figure come from Joe's front door, jump in the van, and speed away. I parked in the newly vacant space on the street. When I got out, I had a good look around. Something was strange about what had just happened. Something didn't sit well with me about the van man. I marched up to the front door and rang the bell. No answer. I rang it again. No answer. I tried the handle and the door creaked open. Joe? I shouted, hoping to God he still lived here. I received no reply when I entered the house. The smell was so overpowering it made me feel lightheaded. I felt like I was struggling to breathe and see. It was petrol. Joe's house smelled like a petrol station. Joe! I screamed as I darted up the stairs. Joe was sitting in the hallway, soaking wet on a wooden seat with tears in his eyes. Joe, what the fuck is going on? I demanded. Joe sat up and whimpered. I'm sorry, son. I'm so sorry. Joe, what? Sorry about what? What the hell is all this? Joe struck a match. All the whispers in the woods. Don't trust anyone. Not even the police. He held the match to his neck. Joe, wait, don't! I barked at him as his whole body was engulfed in flames in the blink of an eye. The fire snaked and spread onto the floor like it was chasing me down. I fell backwards down the stairs. Luckily, I was able to get myself out, but I had hurt myself badly. I was able to make it to my car to phone the emergency services. I picked up my phone. Seven missed calls. It rang again seconds after I picked up. Hello? Hi, is this Mr. Murphy? The worried tone in the woman's voice convinced me this was not going to be good. Yes, speaking. Who is this? 
This is Carolyn from Abby Moore Early Years Daycare and Nursery. You better come down right away. Your son, Julian, is missing. The police are on their way, and so is his mother. I almost choked. It's a phone call nobody ever wants to get. And you never expect it to happen to you. I felt like someone had ripped out every organ in my entire body. I began shaking uncontrollably. What happened? I mean, what? What's happening? I tried to get my words out, but I could barely speak. Sir, if you could get here right away, we will get through the whole protocol with everybody. I'm sure he'll turn up, but we need you both here as soon as possible. I hung up the phone, jumped in my car, and started bombing it down the road back to the nursery. I only left him half an hour ago. This didn't make any sense. I didn't even think about Joe's place burning to the ground. Surely someone would phone it in. What if they saw me speeding away from the scene? All these things rattled around in my mind. I couldn't even think straight, but my train of thought was well and truly stopped in its tracks. Just as I approached Julian's nursery, I parked about halfway down the street because I saw something that made my heart stop. Linda's car, three patrol cars, and a large black transit fan with a strange red W symbol on the side parked amongst them. A week of no answers. I sat in my parked car and observed the comings and goings of the nursery. There were several police officers milling about, and every now and again Linda would pop out crying. She was inconsolable as officers tried to steady her on her feet and calm her down. I hadn't even seen anyone approach the black van yet. I couldn't not go. I had to go in. Otherwise it might draw some suspicion on me somehow. I waited a few more minutes before I pulled out, making sure nobody saw that I was parked just down the street. I pulled up behind the van and got out, hoping to get a look in the back windows. They were tinted too dark, I couldn't see anything at all. They may as well have not been there. As I rounded the van, I got a peek inside the cab. Nothing suspicious to note. I stepped inside the nursery. I could already hear Linda sobbing from outside. I took a deep breath and headed for the office. I opened the door. Four police officers, Linda, a nursery nurse, and the owner, or head of the nursery, turns to face me. The nursery nurse was also crying. Everyone else was stone-faced as they stared, waiting for me to break the silence. I'm Julian's dad. My voice croaked as I realized how dry my mouth was. Linda ran over and threw her arms around me. Why did it have to be him? She sobbed and sniffled as she forced her words out. It'll be okay, Linda. We'll find him. I hugged her back in an attempt to comfort her the only way I knew how. Can somebody fill me in, please? I asked as everybody just stood at twiddling their thumbs. The owner of the daycare spoke up. Julian's been talking about a man who kept trying to take his toys and annoy him. He ran from his class and hid in the cupboard. He went out of sight for ten seconds max, and when the nurse opened the door, he had vanished. We think he didn't go into the cupboard and instead ran outside when he was snatched. It seemed impossible that he could make it that fast, but there was no other explanation. We didn't have any witnesses or any proof of what had happened. To tell the truth, we don't actually have proof of anything at this time. I turned to the police. Who's in charge here? I asked. One officer stepped out of the room without a word. I just looked confused. I need some answers here. This is my son. The officer returned with a tall, bulky, detective-looking guy in an expensive suit. You're looking for the officer in charge? That'll be me, Detective Chief Superintendent Williams. Williams, is that your van parked outside? Feeling sure he wouldn't have seen me at the veteran's house, so I wanted to see if he would slip up. My van? He looked confused. Yes, the black one outside. Whose is it? My voice is getting noticeably louder. I have no idea, said Williams. Let me check that out for you. I followed him outside. Just before we reached the exit, I had the feeling in my guts that I knew exactly what was going to happen here. I wasn't even shocked to see the van was gone. Everyone just looked at me like I was crazy. Must have been someone else's van, I muttered. 
My car was still parked in the same place, right behind where the van once stood. I just couldn't wrap my head around all these bizarre things that kept happening. I didn't have time for this. We had to find jewels. DCS Williams spoke up. So, if yourself and the boy's mother could accompany us to the station, we need statements, and we need statements from the nursery staff. Um, absolutely. No problem. I hesitantly replied. As I was walking away, I overheard Carolyn, the head of the nursery, tell Williams that she had someone park the van one street over. I fucking knew it. I knew something wasn't right with him. This whole situation reeked of shit, and I was going to get to the bottom of it, one way or another. The blue lights all flashed on in unison as the police convoy set off. Then Linda's car. Then myself, with two cars behind me. I could still see Williams and Carolyn talking in my rear view and glancing over to me as we drove away. We drove straight to the station. Once inside, we were taken separately and asked to give a statement. When we last saw Julian, what his mood was like, what was he wearing, did he have many friends, etc., etc. One question caught me off guard, though. It wasn't unusual. I could imagine it was one of the most typical, standard questions in this station. Where were you between 7.45 and 8.15 a.m. this morning? Now, of course, they should have asked anyone and everyone this, but I was at the veteran's house. I didn't want to say I was there, because then that might open a whole other line of questioning. Plus the fact I saw the van there, which was possibly driven by Williams. If he found out I knew he was at that scene, I might be in for a rough time. On the other hand, what if someone saw me fleeing the scene right after the house caught fire? Or worse, what if Williams saw me? I had already hesitated long enough. It was a simple question. It was less than two hours ago, and I was making myself look somewhat suspicious by taking so long to answer. Sorry, my mind is a million miles away, I mumbled, buying myself time. Let me think. I dropped Jules off, then I headed to see one of my dad's old friends, Big Joe McKenzie. You might know him as the veteran. I made sure I didn't speak of him in the past tense. Of course we know Joe. How long were you there for? The detective queried. Oh, uh, seconds. I knocked on the door twice and he never answered, so I just left and started heading home. Then I got the call about Jules and went straight to the nursery, I explained, almost convincing myself. Okay. Was there anyone else there? This struck me as odd. Maybe it was another routine question, but I'm now wondering what they know. Why would they ask that when I'm just visiting a friend and I said if I knocked the door and left, it didn't add up in my head? No, I never saw anyone. The two detectives glanced at each other for a second, then the other asked. The nursery said they called you seven or eight times before getting through. Why was that? I'm not sure. I was probably driving and I didn't hear my phone. It's usually on silent. I only noticed the missed calls when I was checking the time. Then it rang in my hand as I looked. That's when I answered. They both took some notes, then continued asking more questions. I was then asked to sign a statement containing all the information I had just shared with them, and we were done. Thank you for your full cooperation, Mr. Murphy. Our investigations already went beyond the first few steps, so hopefully we'll be able to find Julian soon. The next 48 hours are crucial, so I can assure you we'll be working around the clock to get him home safe. Thank you. Please find him. Please. I pleaded as I shook their hands. We'll do everything we can. They turned and led me back to the lobby, where Lydia was waiting, still red-eyed and crying her heart out. We waited for everyone else to come out from giving their statements, then we all went back to the nursery to try and organize some kind of search party right away. I was suspicious of DCS Williams and now Carolyn, but I felt like I couldn't tell anyone. Like it would backfire, and everyone would think I'm insane and not believe me. I could see how everyone, especially Linda, had their full trust in those two people, and I would need some kind of evidence, something concrete to break up my theory before I go blurting out accusations. But for now, I would play along and just try and find my son. After the first crucial 48 hours, we still hadn't heard a word from the police. 
We had search parties day and night looking everywhere for any signs. Linda would join the day search, but I was able to join both, since I only slept about two or three hours a day anyway. I was out pretty much constantly looking for him. The fact we hadn't had a single update worried me. It felt like they weren't bothering to even search for him. I thought they would have patrols out, police-guided searches, sniffer dogs, helicopters. There was none of that. It was like they had just forgotten. I eventually contacted them, only to be told that they were doing all they could and it was under investigation, blah, blah, blah. After the third day, I was contacting them every hour or two, round the clock. There had to be some kind of update, surely, but every time I contacted was the same story. What was weird was that there had been absolutely no report on Joe's house, or anything about Joe. Not a word by anyone, and not in the local paper. It was like that had just been completely overlooked. I mean, I wasn't really complaining. I didn't want to find myself answering questions about that, but I just thought it was a bit odd that nobody had even mentioned it. Day 5 and 6. The search parties had gotten smaller in numbers and shorter. People were giving up so easily it kind of hurt. I think they must have thought, if a four-year-old was out alone in the winter for five or six days, the search would be either for a body or a kidnapper, and nobody wanted to be confronted by either of those things. There was a select few family and friends still searching relentlessly with us, but we always came up empty-handed. It crushed me every time a search had to be stopped because of weather or some other reason. All I could think of was my poor boy lost and alone, while we all go home and sit in front of our fire. After a week of no answers and constantly calling the station, twenty and thirty times a day, most days, DCS Williams showed up at my door. It was 11 p.m., and he was alone, as was I. Oh, um, hi. Is everything okay? I wasn't expecting anyone tonight, I said, as he stood on my porch, wet from the rain. Good evening, Mr. Murphy. I just wanted to stop by, you know, unofficially. To see how you were getting on, he declared in his comforting baritone voice. Well, I suppose I'm holding up, considering I'm actually getting ready. There's another search. May I come too, Cameron? He interrupted. Is it okay if I call you Cameron? He said, placing one foot over the threshold. Um, I suppose so. I, I don't really care. I mumbled as he pushed his way inside. He walked straight into my lounge and sat down, making himself at home as if I had already told him to do so. I followed shortly after, still a bit wary about this whole thing. Please, sit. He gestured to the armchair sitting to the left of the couch. So, what's this all about? I asked. What? No cup of tea? You don't have guests around often, do you? He stared directly in my eyes. I felt intimidated. He was a big guy. Um, well, I I don't have any tea bags. Sorry. I felt like I was already walking on eggshells, like this could go south at any second. He continued to stare menacingly. Not to worry. Relax, kid. So, do you have absolutely no idea why I'm here? He began pulling some folded up papers from his long coat. I... no. I've got no idea. Sorry, I said, trying to catch a glimpse of the papers he held in his hand. Well, he looked and flipped through at a couple of sheets. You told one of my detectives that you attended the dwelling of Mr. Joe McKenzie on the morning Julian went missing. He looked up from the paper with an over-exaggerated friendly grin. I did? Yes, I replied. Okay, okay. He looked back, smiling at the papers he ruffled in his hands. Okay, thank you. So, can you tell me why you failed to mention anything about Joe's house burning to the ground? Immediately, I felt like I was under attack, but I couldn't let it show. I, I didn't hear anything about that. It wasn't on fire when I got there. I was stumbling over my words. Ah, okay. So you'd already left the area before the fire started? He looked at me with unconvincing reassurance. Relax, Cameron. You're not under arrest or anything. 
You're getting a bit fidgety. I just don't want you to think I had anything to do with it, I said, reaching for a cigarette. And why would I think that, Cameron? You got there, chapped the door, nobody answered. You left. Simple as that. You saw absolutely nothing else at all. Is that correct? He was now staring at me so intently I struggled to look back. I, no, I saw nothing at all. I must have looked visibly shaken by now. Good, he said, returning to the reassuring, friendly smile he must have used a million times. I saw right through it. Well, I best be off. Don't want you to be late for your search party. He stood up and hastily walked to the front door. I followed closely, feeling relieved. Then, he turned just as the door opened and whispered in my ear. By the way, whatever that old cunt told you, you keep your fucking mouth shut, or I'll have you locked up so fast you'll get whiplash. Then, he giggled loud and spoke in an obnoxiously loud voice as he walked over to his car. Well, thanks for the tea, Cameron. I wish the best in your search tonight. If you ever need anything, you give me a call straight away. He smiled again and got into his car. I was scared, I'll be honest. I was in a rage. I was pissed off, but I was fucking terrified. He knew I was there. He knows what happened, and he knows that I know he was there. He came here to shut me up, to make sure I wasn't going to say anything. This whole tragedy, the fire, the veteran's death, it's all been covered up because he knows I saw him there. Although, why was he worried about what Joe had told me? There were so many questions, but right now I was unable to even think about all of that, because I was staring at my table and the pile of papers DCS Williams had left behind. I didn't know if I should look, or, in fact... I knew immediately there was no point in having any kind of internal debate on whether or not to look. As soon as I saw them, I knew I was looking. I picked them up. They were printouts of pictures, taken the morning Julian went missing. They showed me, arriving at Joe's. Me and Joe's door. Me entering Joe's door. Me running from Joe's house while the upstairs window had a dim orange glow that wasn't present in the others. Me driving away. Another of me driving away. And Joe's house in a fiery blaze, top to bottom. So obviously this did not look good. Considering I'd already lied to the police about my whereabouts, it made it look even more suspicious. He left these here on purpose, to show me what he had on me. And he had me completely under his thumb. And it would take a fucking miracle for me to get out. If anything, this made me take Joe's final words more seriously. I couldn't trust anyone, and I would have to do some digging for information about the woods or find out what the hell is going on. What did he mean by the whispers? I knew of only one other person I felt like I could potentially trust. My friend Archie, who I grew up with. All throughout school and our childhood, we had been best friends. Although the past eight years or so, I've only spoken with him a handful of times. If I was taking my shot and telling someone everything, the truth, then it was going to be him. I just hoped they hadn't gotten to him first. When I met Archie the following morning, he looked depressed. He looked malnourished and at the end of his rope. The reason we never spoke much for all these years wasn't through lack of trying. Archie just became a bit of a hermit, for lack of a better word. About eight years ago, he was married to one of his lifelong friends, Michelle. They were each other's first loves and got married at nineteen. About five years later, she fell pregnant. When Michelle was giving birth, she had to be put under with anesthesia, and she swore she heard the baby cry when it was born. The doctors told her she had a stillbirth, and she might have been hallucinating. They wouldn't even let Archie in the ward. They said it would be too distressing. She killed herself about eight months later. Archie found her hanging in their garage. The death of the baby was bad enough but they wouldn't release the body. Apparently, it was some protocol that it was taken to a tiny coffin and buried in a small cemetery nearby the hospital, under a memorial stone with the inscription, Ben, born asleep. The nurses let them name the baby before he was laid to rest. Neither of them got to hold their firstborn. Then, 
Still grieving, he finds his beloved wife swinging from a rope. He just collapsed in on himself and became reclusive. I didn't even know how long it had been since he last ate, or even seen anyone. Archie, I spoke softly as he sat in his porch staring at the ground. He didn't respond. Archie, it's me, Cameron. I took a few steps toward him and sat on the ground in his line of sight. How are you? I've missed you, man. I extended a hand and his eyes met mine. Kill me. How are you? It's been fucking ages. His hand came forth and shook mine. I'm okay, Archie. I don't know if you heard or not. It's Julian. He's went missing. He sat in silence for a few seconds. I'm missing? What the fuck? How? Where? What happened? He began to come to life. It's a bit of a long story, man. We should go inside, though. I don't want anybody else knowing I'm here. I got up and opened the front door. The house stank and was an absolute mess. We both entered. I sat in a chair. Archie sat on the couch opposite. I told him absolutely everything. From the woods, to Avi Lawkin, to Julian disappearing, to Williams threatening me the night before. Archie stared at Dumbfounded, but he didn't seem as surprised as I expected with some of the details. That rat bastard Williams, man. I knew there was something crooked about him. He snarled as he looked off to the side, thinking. I know. I knew something wasn't right. The whole thing with the van was just completely off. I replied, shaking my head. Archie sat in silence for a few moments. I need to tell you something, Cammy. He rose from his battered old couch and walked over to his fireplace. He took something down. His house was dark, but I could make out it was some sort of doll. He threw it over to me. I looked at it. It was muddy and rotten. I felt confused. What is this? Was this a toy bought for Ben or something? Archie came closer, tears visible in his face. No, Kevin, this is fucking Ben. He spoke with aggression. After Michelle's suicide, I went fucking haywire, started taking all sorts of drugs and drinking. I went to that cemetery and dug up Ben's grave. I didn't know what I was thinking or what I planned on doing. But inside his tiny little coffin, Cammy, there was this fucking doll. He grabbed it and threw it into the unlit log fire. He continued. And I got arrested. And guess who fucking let me off with it? That fucker Williams. He assured me I wouldn't go to prison if I just kept my mouth shut. Fed me some shit about the hospital using stillborn babies for some kind of research. All above board and government approved blah blah fucking blah. I stared at Archie, not believing my ears. He fucking manipulated me into keeping silent and acted like he was my friend. If he's behind this somehow, I'll fucking kill him, man. Shouting now as he paced up and down the room. When I saw Archie in this fit of rage and anger, hearing those words, an ever so slight smile crept onto my face. Listen, Archie, me and you, we're gonna sort all this shit out, I exclaimed, as I just realized that I had found my guy. A Trail of Whispers It didn't take long for Archie to come to his senses. He knew exactly what we had to do. We had to find out who was all behind this, and what was really going on. I suggested the best place to start would be the woods between Oakwood and Avi Lockham. It was decided Archie's home, although it was a dump, would be our base, since I figured nobody would have eyes on it, at least not for a while. We would reconvene here every night to talk over anything we had found out and discuss our next steps. Something else occurred to me while we spoke that first night. I never made it to the second clearing in the woods that night. I went for my walk. This particular clearing is just north of the spider, but there has always been something so unusual about it. 
and I've never been able to put my finger on it. 57.222924, negative 3.818597. These are the coordinates for this area. If you happen to look it up, you will notice it's unnaturally green, so bright, in fact, that nowhere within miles is actually that green. Additionally, there is always a sense of being watched, though not in a sinister way. It's as if you're being held and you're safe, like you're being guarded from all around in a bubble. As this all began in those woods, I had to decide it was probably where we were going to first, to see if we can find anything at all. That very first night, after I got Archie a good meal and made him rest up, we would head up to Oakwood to investigate. There was no time to waste. I drove his beat-up old Nissan to the campground and we sat at the entrance while I described to him what the plan was. Put simply, we would head straight along the trail until we were pretty much in line with the clearing, then head directly through the woods quietly and avoiding being distracted by anything that made us feel uneasy, such as noises or weird men casually walking around alone. And basically, keep our eyes on the prize, I said. It was 1am exactly when we exited the vehicle and made our way through the gates to Oakwood, heading straight for the trail at the top. There were no voices from the campground this time. As we reached the trail, I started getting goosebumps all over. Remembering everything that had happened a little over a week ago, it felt like I had forgotten, like it was a distant memory that had all come rushing back to haunt me, and it made me weak at the knees just thinking about what possibly lay ahead. I took a look overhead. The moon was full tonight and bright as ever. The sky was clear and the familiar stars and constellations twinkled into light in my return. I looked to Archie, who didn't seem half as phased as I did. We going for it then? I asked, nodding my head. Fuck right we are. He replied, nodding back. We set off along the trail. Wind brushed the treetops on either side to break the quiet. I felt uneasy, expecting to see someone appear from the distance or from the tree line at any second. Archie marched beside me with purpose. I'm not sure he believed me when I told him what happened the last time I was here. I didn't mind. His confidence gave me a boost, if anything. We had walked around ten minutes through the trail and were approaching the bend. What lay beyond, I dread to think. I began to feel the hairs on my neck prick up as a vile, icy wind came from behind and slapped us with the cold. I pulled my collar up and shivered, my breath now visible in the air. As we hit the turning point, I heard something. I could feel those familiar eyes piercing me from every angle, but I made sure not to look anywhere but straight ahead. I heard it again. Welcome. It sounded like in a soft, slow whisper. Then, welcome back. This was a little more clear, but sounded like multiple whispers from all around us. I stared straight ahead. I could now see the final straight of the trail leading to the lake. I turned to Archie. His confident demeanor had faded rapidly, and he looked like he was ready to turn back. We came this far, Archie. It'll be okay, I reassured him although I wasn't entirely sure he was quite convinced. I saw his jaw drop as he looked ahead and to the left. I looked up. About forty or fifty feet away, a head was peeking out from behind a tree, wide, dark eyes and white as a sheet. The face was grinning and motionless. A soft mist fell and the head was gone. What way is this clearing bit we're going to? The left or right? Archie asked, voice shaking and full of uncertainty. It's left, I replied. Right. Fuck this Blair Witch Project shit. I'll get you back at the car. I'm not going in there. Archie said, already turning on his heels. I grabbed his arm. Archie, don't worry. If anything happens, we stick together. If you run back alone, what do you think's going to be waiting for you around that corner? Archie sighed. Well, we should both go back then. Come during the day. This is fucked up. I grabbed both his arms. Listen, Archie, we're never going to find anyone here during the day except tourists and idiots. We're here to find out what goes on at night. If shit hits the fan, then we run. But we run together and we stick together no matter what. Archie gave me another big sigh. Right. Fuck. Okay. Move. Let's do this in a hurry up. I turned back toward the lake. 
The mist was getting a little thicker now. We couldn't see too far ahead. We both stopped in our tracks for a moment to listen, coming from our front and to the left. It was mostly unintelligible, like a crowd of people whispering different words all at once. The fog rolled from right to left and got progressively thicker. I heard torqued ropes swinging slowly from branches, and the whispering got more frequent. Our pace had slowed, and suddenly we came to a halt. In the fog not far ahead of us, there were seven figures standing in a line, black as coal and tall with hooded robes. They stared as we stared back, and slowly, one by one, moved to the tree line, like they were floating or gliding. I never saw any movement from their legs. My head was pounding out of my chest. We were almost at the point where we should head into the woods, but I decided we should go in now, get through to the green clearing fast, and avoid getting any closer to those figures in the fog. The whispering became louder and seemed more aggressive. The fog became thicker. I thought I saw some bodies hanging from the trees, so we adjusted our path accordingly, making sure to stay away. Sometimes the whispers seemed to swirl around us like a tornado of hate, and when we changed direction slightly, they would come from only a certain way, as if they were leading us to where we had to be. We were now literally following the whispers before I even realized that's what Joe had told me to do. A dim yellow and orange glow made itself visible as we approached the clearing, still through thick wood, but flickers of its light danced past us every few steps. It grew brighter as we got closer. I already knew, but I confirmed to myself anyway that it was a fire. I heard laughing and whispering mantras from beyond the three or four layers of trees that separated us from the green grass. There were several hooded figures standing in a line as two others walked back and forth, making signs with their hands and making everyone drink from a large bowl or chalice type thing. It seemed like there was absolutely no fog here. We looked all around and saw nothing beyond about two trees in every direction, but looking into the clearing, we could see everything as clear as day. I felt a soft hand caress the back of my head. I flinched and found nothing behind me. I was so close to screaming, but I knew I couldn't give away our position. We inched forward. Still, the whispering went on and the fire raged. One of the hooded men was making hand gestures as if he was controlling the fire as it waltzed about ten feet high before him. Every now and then he would throw something on the fire that would make it burst in a ball of flame and light up the whole area. During one of these, I noticed there was more hooded people watching from the tree line behind them. Another burst. I saw more. To the left and right. Another. And another. Every time it happened, I saw more and more of them all around the clearing, watching from the shadows. I felt ice on my neck. My eyes started to go hazy as I felt those grotesque long fingers snake around my neck, and a slow, deep, gargling growl like a beast stalking its prey. I tried my best to keep my eyes open and make out the face of any person in the robes before me. I looked at Archie. There was a glowing white visage with sharp, pointed, grinning teeth, nose to nose with him. He smiled a huge grin in return, and his eyes rolled back as he fell to the ground and began to seize. The last thing I saw was foam pouring from between Archie's larger-than-normal teeth as he smiled and smiled and shook all over, groaning with increasing insanity. The last thing I felt was the grip around my neck tightening, then felt like I was being cradled to sleep. Then my eyes began to roll back. I was in a dark room, bound to a wooden chair. The rope around my wrists burned my skin. A single black candle cast a faint glow. There were seven hooded figures lined up in front of me one waving some kind of incense that smelled like putrid shit. They began to approach me. I tried to scream. I tried to vigorously free my hands. I felt like I was about to have a heart attack. And then... I woke up. Beads of morning dew scurried down my face. I had no idea what the hell happened. I was lying in the damp grass in the center of the clearing. Archie was gone. I got to my feet. My body ached as I tried my best to move myself around to see if there was anything or anyone in sight. There was nothing. No people, 
No fire, no evidence that there was ever anybody there, just hours earlier. The only thing I did notice were some small, polished-looking rounded stones near the north side of the clearing. They were arranged in two V-shapes, and a circle. Apart from that, there was nothing, not even any sign of a fire. I sat on a stump for a few minutes. I needed the strength in my legs. I didn't even know what time it was. I started heading back to the trail and then to Oakwood. I assumed Archie bolted and took the car. But when I got the entrance in my sight, the car was still there. There were people standing by it. One looked very familiar, and as I got closer, my worst fear was realized. Williams stood by the car, smiling as he watched me walk towards it. New car, Cammy? He smiled as he asked, knowing full well it wasn't mine. Apparently, the owners phoned the police about a car blocking the entrance. Why a detective chief superintendent would have responded to that call would be beyond most people, but I knew exactly why he was there. It's not my car, actually, I replied, shaking my head. Well, we'll get this car towed then, buddy. See who picks it up, he said, still smiling. In the meantime, why don't you hop in my car? I think we should take a drive. I have an update on Julian's case. I agreed without a word. I just climbed into his car, happy to feel the soft leather seat. I sat with my head in my hands as Williams got in next to me. He turned and stared at me for longer than felt comfortable. I could see him in my periphery, but I did not respond. He then gave a chuckle and started the engine. It purred aloud as we pulled out of the camp entrance. So, Cameron, he started. I already felt sick at the possibilities of what was to come. He continued. What's this all about? Spending the night in some woods, creeping around a campsite. I lifted my head and looked straight forward, noticing he wasn't driving toward the town. I was looking for Julian. I must have passed out or something. I haven't been sleeping well. Williams looked at me again. His massive form seemed almost too big for the car. He filled me with fear. Ah, he exclaimed. Well, that's good to see. Such dedication. I looked at him for the first time. He was still smiling. Where are we going? I asked nervously. Just taking in a little scenery. Calm ourselves down a bit. It's been a long night for both of us. William said, his eyes darting between me and the road. He slowed almost to a halt and took a cut off from the road into some more forest, a few miles north from what I could tell. He pulled the car over in the middle of some trees. Get out. His voice had changed, and the fake smile became a very real frown. I quickly did as I was told. Williams got out after me. He came up close to my face. Now, Cameron. He began in a low yet aggressive voice. I specifically told you to keep your mouth shut. He hissed, spit flying from his mouth. A rage that seems to come from nowhere. I have kept my mouth shut. I spoke back like a disobedient child. I haven't said a word to anyone. Is that so? He replied. Then what the fuck were you and that junkie Archie doing in the woods? I know that was his car. What are you talking about? I don't know why his car was there, but I was looking for Julian. That's all. I lied, unconvincingly. Sure, okay. But the thing is, I know you're full of shit, Cameron. I saw you both, and you saw far too much. He snarled, his voice growling in anger. He punched me in the gut. It felt as though my ribs had wrapped all the way around his fist. I dropped to the ground, struggling for a breath. What did you do with Archie? I managed to push out between deep, labored breaths. I don't know where he is. Probably away buying some heroin, the fucking scumbag. He went on after circling my whimpering body as I knelt on the ground. But when I find him, he's a fucking dead man. He's already had his last chance, and now I'm giving you yours. He brought his fist down and hammered the back of my neck. 
This is the last time I want to have to tell you this. Keep your fucking mouth shut. And don't go looking around in places you have no business being. He turned and took a step towards his car and opened the driver's door. Cameron, he called as he sat inside. I looked up at him, defeated in body and mind. I almost forgot. If you want to see your son alive, do not fucking cross me ever again. He slammed the door and sped off, leaving me broken on the marshy soil. I wanted to scream at him. I wanted to get up and kill him, but I had absolutely no fight in me. I lay there, sobbing, for the longest time. I didn't know what I could do next, if anything. The Rolling Heads When I woke up, I checked my phone. 1.51 AM. I felt sick. The painkillers I had were making me drowsy, but my insomnia would always prevail. The feeling they gave me was horrible when I would wake in the middle of the night. Usually it helps to get up and eat something, but I was especially sore that night. It had been six days since I saw Williams at Oakwood. Whatever happened the night before had left my bones and my whole body in agony. I struggled to walk. I struggled to eat. I struggled to piss. I still hadn't heard from Archie or anyone else. Not Linda, not the police, the nursery, none of my friends, nobody. I knew there were sporadic searches for jewels going on, but I was never able to attend. Although nobody ever contacted me to tell me when they were happening anyway. I only knew from seeing bits and pieces in the local paper. I felt completely isolated. I couldn't think why Linda, of all people, wouldn't have come to check in on me at least once, not even wondering why I wasn't looking for our son anymore. I spent most hours of the past few days in bed, awake. I would get an hour or two sleep here and there, but even falling asleep had me scared. I was having these horrendous reoccurring nightmares about the woods, about the dark room I was in. The faces I had seen often hiding, watching my every move, getting closer as the days went by. I kept hearing whispers and chanting when I was about to fall asleep. When I would close my eyes, I would see that dim glow through the trees, and I would start getting closer against my will. Then, at the last second, a rope around my neck would pull me up, and I would be swinging from a branch. Just another body in the woods. The chanting would get louder as the life slipped away from me, and my eyes grew dark and heavy. Then I would wake up. Tonight, I woke up to a different dream. I'm sure it was a dream. Honestly, I hope it was. I was laying in bed. It was just after 11 p.m., and my TV shone a soft, pale glow around my room as it sat on Netflix while I did the usual, spending about two hours looking for something to watch. As I flicked through seemingly endless titles nobody had ever heard of, I heard a thud, like a bag of sand falling from height. It came from outside, so I ignored it and continued. I heard another thud, then another quickly after. I turned my head to face the window, wondering what it was. I heard another two or three in quick succession. This was followed by a kind of scraping sound, not like metal or stone or wood. It was like someone was dragging a bag of meat across the road. I heard more. Thud, thud. More dragging, scraping noises soon followed. I struggled to get myself out of bed. The painkillers were wearing off, and my muscles were cramping from lying down so much. I slowly walked to the window, startled by another set of thoughts as I got closer. They were coming very regularly now, every few seconds. I got to my window and cupped my hands around my face to obscure the reflections of my TV and room. There were severed heads rolling along my street. Every one of them had their eyes open wide, staring directly at me as they rolled along casually, some of them smiled and laughing, some of them scowling and baring their teeth at me like a dog, all of them rolling in the same direction, towards the woods. I took a step back. A loud noise from behind me almost made me collapse in fear, as I heard the slow dragging sounds start towards me. The next thing I knew, it was 1.51 a.m., and I'm in bed, 
drenched in sweat. I couldn't tell if it was real or not. My dreams sometimes blend into reality and vice versa. Sometimes I would black out and wake up in a different room. It always seemed like everything was telling me to go back to those woods. Something I didn't want to do, but when I got my strength back, I knew I probably would end up back there. I would rather die trying to save my son than let this fucking weird cult or whatever they were get away with it. 6 a.m., and someone has been banging on my door for almost half an hour now. I eventually managed to get myself downstairs and saw a silhouette through the frosted patio glass. Who is it? I shouted, acting like I was strong enough to take on any intruders. They knocked again. Hear me? A loud whisper came through. It's Archie. Let me in. I quickly opened the sliding door. Archie fell inside. He had his ear against the glass, listening for my response. He probably didn't think I would just open the door. Fuck, he moaned as he picked himself up. You could have warned me. I wasn't interested. I just went back and sat down. Shut the door. What's going on? Where the fuck have you been, man? I asked, annoyed, but glad to see he was alive at least. Kirby, I have to leave you. I'm sorry. I didn't want Williams finding me. I looked at him. But what, so you just left me? I tried getting you up, but you were kicking me and screaming and shit. I went to get the car, but I saw Williams rifling through it like he was looking for something. So I went a different way, and I've tried to stay out of sight until I could find anything else out. He explained. He seemed genuinely apologetic in his tone, but at the end of the day... He still left me lying in the woods. And did you find anything out? I asked. I did. Cammy, you will believe this shit, man. He said, standing up. My ears pricked up. After these past couple of weeks, I don't think I'll ever doubt anything again. What did you find, Archie? Now more interested than ever. Archie began. When I left, I went home. My house had been ransacked. I think it was just a message. And nothing was taken, so I'm assuming they knew from the start we were working together. So I went to Inverness to my mom's house to lay low. I borrowed her car and drove through during the night. The first place I went was the cemetery where Ben was buried. He made air quotes with his fingers when he said the name Ben. I dug up another two random graves in the stillbirth memorial site. Both had dolls in them. He looked at me dead in the eyes. Whoever is involved in this cover-up, it must go pretty high. That's newborn babies being taken from expectant parents. God knows what for, and nobody's ever even mentioned it. Then, I checked the dates on the graves. There have been stillbirths buried there in the same month every year. The farthest back I saw was over 30 years ago. Of course, I didn't check every one. There wasn't much time. He paused and waited for my reaction. I was dumbfounded. For over thirty years, babies had been taken from their parents at birth. I... I don't know what to say, Archie. I stuttered. That's absolutely fucking insane. What else did you find? I asked eagerly. He sat down again and continued. Oh, well... The night after that, I waited outside the police station to see if Williams came out. I got there about ten and sat down in the car and watched. I didn't see him, but I saw that black van you mentioned leaving the car park. There were two people inside. He pulled a crudely drawn map from his coat. I followed it for a few minutes. Then the next night, I waited at the place. I stopped the night before to see if he would pass again. Sure enough, he drove right by. So I followed for another few minutes. Bit by bit, I followed it night after night. It goes out of town every night at the same time. I managed to follow the lights from a distance while I drove behind. There's a cutoff into the woods from the road about a mile past A.V. Lock-In on the A-9. It leads to winding crossroads in the woods. I couldn't go too far in, but I stopped and watched until the lights disappeared and had drawn a kind of map to where I followed it to. He handed me the map. 
I studied it and then asked. So, what happened after that? Did you find out where it leads to? Fuck that. I came straight here. We need to go together. He said, clenching his fists as if he was giving a motivational speech. Okay, well, we can't right now. I can barely move. But I'll try and get myself fit again, and we can go from there. In the meantime, I'd suggest you lay low at your mom's again. I said, getting myself to my feet. Come back down in a couple of days. I don't want to start using phones and shit. I don't know what these people have planted in here. There could be anything. Archie nodded. No worries, Kim. Get yourself better, and I'll see you soon. He left seconds later without another word, and I dragged myself up the stairs, bones aching and muscles cramping. The painkillers lay on my bedside table. They made me feel like shit, so I was probably going to have to give them up for a start, just to try and power through the pain, try and walk more and get my muscles working. That night, I fell asleep about midnight. I had a dream where I was strangling Julie and while hooded figures stood in a circle and laughed maniacally. I cried and cried as his lifeless body dangled from my tightly gripped hands. I woke up half an hour later. I knew that sound, and I did not want to see that again. So I pulled my cover over my head and turned the volume on my TV up. Why was I being tormented constantly? I lay awake for hours just listening to the thuds and dragging sounds. It was like the TV was incapable of drowning anything out. My body screamed for painkillers. My mind screamed for peace and quiet. I wished I could just sleep. Just one night. I made it through the next two nights feeling progressively worse. Archie visited, but I wasn't ready. I told him to maybe try again in a few days. I wasn't optimistic, though I would try my best. The following three days and nights were much the same, and constant pain and no sleep, usually recurring nightmares. I was beginning to feel like I had lost my mind. I was vomiting, couldn't eat, my eyes were bloodshot and sore, but finally I was able to walk without screaming in pain or needing painkillers. Archie arrived again. He had a very different expression on his face, one of fear, of a man driven mad by some traumatic event. He came in and sat down. Archie, what's wrong? I asked him, and he stared into space. I went to the place during the day, Cammy. I don't know what it is, but there was an evil there. I could hear shrill screams of pain and anguish. The smell of rotten flesh filled the whole area and there were burning pits still smoldering. There were things inside them. I hoped it was just animals, but I'm scared that it wasn't. He put his hands over his face. We should maybe go back during the day, just to check it out, so I can have a look too, and we can come up with some sort of plan, I suggested tentatively. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. He agreed after a few moments of silence. Should we bring anything with us? I asked, just trying to fill the silence. I don't know. We should maybe take some sort of weapons. I really don't think we should stay long, though. In and out. We need to be quick. Archie replied, still covering his face. Okay, I'll see what I have. I went out to the shed in my back garden. There were a whole bunch of gardening tools I hadn't touched in years. I pulled out a pitchfork and a garden hoe. Then the two largest knives from the kitchen I had. It was the best I could think of. This is pretty much it, unless you know anyone with a gun. I gestured, remaining half serious. Archie just looked at me. We did know some farmers, but whether they had guns or not, we couldn't say for sure. In any case, I highly doubted they would give us one if they did. We ate some lunch at my house, packed Archie's mom's car with the stuff we had, and set off. It would only be about 20 to 30 minutes of driving. Archie's face was still glum, looking genuinely terrified the whole way. As we turned into the forest, he was muttering to himself incoherently. We rolled up to a small patch of woods with a lower density of trees and bushes. Just beyond that lay a large log cabin, and just like Archie had said, 
There were blank, burnt-out pits dotted around. I told him I would go and have a quick look a bit closer. He was extremely reluctant to get out, so he remained in the car. I got out. The foul stench in the air was thick. It felt almost humid and smelled like rotten meat. There was an unbelievable sense of hostility and dread surrounding the place. I almost didn't go any closer, but I wanted to just peek inside a window at least. The dried out leaves and twigs crumpled and crunched under my boots. I tried to stay as silent as I could. I tried not to breathe. My heart was beating out of my chest, and I rounded a burn pit. There seems to be charred bones in the middle, surrounded by blackness. The whole place reeked of death. The hairs on my neck sprang up. I had a horrible feeling, the putrid, toxic air choking me as I got closer. The windows were caked in dirt and difficult to see through. I peeked inside one. I saw nothing. An empty bedroom by the look of it. I glanced back at Archie in the car. He looked worried and desperate to leave. I held up one finger, signaling to him I would be just one more minute. He shook his head. I turned and walked around the side of the cabin to the next window. I got on my tiptoes as this window was higher. I just managed to peer over the edge. This was a large room, almost like a kind of hall. There were statues and symbols all over. What struck me, though, was that the room was almost entirely painted red from floor to ceiling. It felt like a pure, malevolent force was drawing me in, pulling me closer, consuming my soul. The sheer belligerence of some unknown being emanating hatred and malice of the highest potency. My senses had been compromised. My vision started to blur. The silence was absolute. A twig snapped behind me. Excuse me. A familiar, shaky voice broke the dead silence. The Black Mass. I spun around in absolute horror. It felt like the world spun around beneath my feet as I stood stationary, like the universe was turning to face me. I saw dead, black eyes and a huge, gaping mouth. They seemed to ooze black tar as this shimmering, smoke-like form was collapsing in on itself, sucking the essence of life from all around to sustain its very existence. Flowers, weeds, grass, all withered and died as the black mass slowly made its way over to consume me. I fell to the ground. I couldn't scream. My vision was still blurry, and like an echo through a canyon, I could hear Archie screaming my name. I stared, utterly terrified and frozen in fear, as I got closer. The screams and pain of thousands audible from within the black pit of its body. I heard Julian. He was calling me, screaming for help. His little voice. I didn't know if it was some kind of sick deception or not. I'm so sorry, Jules. I said in my mind, as my eyes welled up. That was the point I had accepted my impending demise. I felt myself jerked to the side, then arms snaked under me. I was being dragged, and I didn't know where to or by what. I blacked out. The gentle rocking and swaying made me feel like a feeble baby being cradled by its soft, comforting mother. I could even hear the heartbeat. The temptation to suck my thumb was there but I resisted, remembering who I was. I came to Archie's mom's car, and he sped along the road. Where are we? I asked. What happened? Archie was white as a sheet and looked dirty. He never spoke back. After maybe fifteen minutes, I saw a sign. Welcome to the city of Inverness, capital of the Highlands. Archie... What are we doing in Inverness? I asked, feeling more assertive. I was lying across the back seat and I began to sit up. Archie! I raised my voice a little. Why are we in Inverness? Archie looked in the mirror at me. His eyes were bloodshot and damp. He had been crying. Because it's away from that fucking place, that's why. He shouted back. I never challenged him on it. He seemed pissed off and I never had the energy. We arrived at Archie's mom's house twenty minutes later and went inside. His mom barely even acknowledged our presence. 
She was an old, miserable woman. I never liked her, even when we were young. She would hit us and scream at us. Supposedly, she was a suspect for a double murder when we were five or six years old. We never understood much about it at the time, but she never went to jail, so I can only assume she never did it. It never made me capable that she wasn't capable of such an act, though. She was truly a horrible person. Even Archie called her the witch. We went through the hallway to the spare bedroom, and Archie told me to get some sleep. I rested, but couldn't sleep for the life of me. As much as I wanted to, as broken as I was, I still could not sleep. I lay staring at the ceiling for what seemed like days. It gave me time to process everything that had happened. I hadn't heard anything from Linda. If I'm honest, I was a bit worried. I had to try and contact her somehow at some point. I had to know if she knew anything or found anything out. Archie came in a good five or six hours later. Cammy. Whatever that was we saw, we need to try and forget about it. Just forget it as best we can and move on. We can't go back there. Ever. I looked on, still deep in thought. I need to see Linda. I need to know what she knows, if anything. I replied, sitting half up on the bed. Archie came around to my side. Look, we can't face up to anything like that. Whatever goes on in that town is their problem. Fuck Abby Moore. Fuck Linda. Fuck Williams. And that bitch at the nursery, whatever her name is. Fuck them all. He continued. You can start a new life here. Forget about it all. I stared into space, weighing up my options. Okay, I said. But if there comes a time I want or need to go back, I'll be met with no resistance. I can make my own decisions. Of course, Archie said, nodding his head in confirmation. He produced a large bowl of porridge. Get this in you. Get your strength back, and we can start finding you somewhere to stay. I reluctantly took the porridge. I wasn't a fan, but I was absolutely starving, so I ended up eating it all. Every day I spent feeling constantly in fear. Every night, even more so. I never walked at night anymore. I did try once, although I didn't get very far. I didn't even make it out of my own street. Aside from that, I found a place to stay. I was eating better. I wasn't in constant pain anymore. I felt like I was able to live. I thought about Julian every single day. How I missed him. How I was too much of a coward to try harder to get him back. We laid low for roughly two months. I never saw Archie much. I think he fell back into his old drug habits. I just tried to stay sane. I took a job at a local bar. I worked pretty much constantly. I felt like I needed people around me as much as possible. It made me feel safer. All of this was brought to a sudden halt. A man entered the bar, drunk out of his mind. He was staggering and smashing glasses. The manager asked me to escort him out. As we got outside, he turned and faced me, sober and deadly serious. This will ring at 2 a.m. Do not miss it, he whispered as he placed a mobile phone in my pocket. I pushed him away, and he fell. He started shouting incoherent babble, and he staggered off. I took the phone from my pocket. I could feel the fear creeping up my leg. I didn't want to know what this was about. I got back to my flat at around 1 a.m. I sat on my bed and switched the TV on. The phone lay by my side. I was watching old episodes of Only Fools and Horses. The one where Del Boy falls through the bar was on. It's one of my favorites. I had pretty much forgotten about the phone when a vibration on my leg startled me. I looked down. Unknown number calling. I swiped to answer. Cameron, you need to come back. I think there are people trying to kill me. A nervous voice dripping in worry was evident from the other end. I could feel the fear and emotion through the phone. It was Linda. What? Linda, what's happening? Who's trying to kill you? I can't talk, Cameron. You have to come back. You have to help me. She begged down the phone. Linda, I... The line went dead. 
None of this made sense. Who was the person that gave me the phone? Why don't they help? Why me? I desperately did not want to go back, but what else was I supposed to do? Maybe she knew something about Julian. The next morning, I went to Archie's mom's house. He was in bed, wasted. I slapped the shit out of him until he woke up, pouring water on his face and bundled him into the back of the car. Whoa, whoa, what the fuck's going on, man? He screeched, sounding like he was mimicking a line from a Cheech and Chong movie. What the fuck's going on, Archie? Is that you're a fucking waster, and you're never gonna get better if you don't face your demons. Linda phoned me last night, and I realized that no matter what I do, and for however long, this will always stick with me until I fight back. I explained seemingly to a brick wall with a mustache. My words were in one ear and out the other as he stared blankly at my face. Archie, liven the fuck up, man. Wake up. His eyes were falling shut. I reached in and slapped his legs. Wake up, Archie. I shouted much louder. Where are we going, man? He asked, as if he hadn't heard a word I had said. I told you, Linda Font, she needs help. We need to help, and if I'm going, then you're going. Staying here is just killing you anyway. I exclaimed, still with a raised voice. Okay, whatever. I'm just gonna shut my eyes for a minute. Archie mumbled as his head rolled around and settled on a bag in the back seat. I pulled into the car park. I turned and punched Archie in the balls. Fucking wake up, idiot! I screamed. He lifted his head, apparently not feeling the punch. Where are we? He muttered, rubbing his eyes. Hold on, what the fuck are we doing here? He said nervously as he saw we were at Inverness Police Station. What have I done, Cammy? Why are we here? He continued, beginning to quake. Archie, listen. Does your uncle still work here? That bald guy, Chuck or Charlie or whatever? I asked pensively. No, no, he left here years ago. I think he lives on the island somewhere. Why? He replied. Well, do you know anyone high up in there? Anyone at all? I was disappointed, but this seemed like our only hope. I don't know. My mom knows the chief inspector, I think. I think he's the chief inspector anyway. He spoke like he was confused at his own words. Go in and ask. In fact, I'll do it. What's his name? I said hurriedly. Archie thought for a moment. It's either Buchanan or McAllister. My head fell in my hands. Archie, those names couldn't be more different. I can't say Chief Inspector Buchanan. Oh, sorry, I mean McAllister. That wouldn't make any sense. Fucking think. Where's your brain? I was getting anxious and a little pissed off at this point. He paused for a good while. It's McKinnis, he said, pumping his fist like he had just won a prize. So, not Buchanan or McAllister, but McKinnis. I was shaking my head. How sure are you, Archie? I stupidly asked him, expecting a high number. I'm about 40% sure, he said, laughing like an idiot. Fuck this, I mumbled to myself as I got out of the car. I made my way to the reception, and the desk sergeant asked me what I was here for. I need to see Chief Inspector McGinnis, I stated, hoping to God that it was the right name. It's extremely important, a matter of the highest urgency. I added. The desk sergeant made two calls, then looked up. You can't just walk in and speak to the chief, sir, but he will see you in five minutes. Now bear in mind he is a very busy man, so be quick. He snapped, as I had already started backing away from the desk. Seconds later, a small, fat man emerged with round glasses and a sense of urgency in everything he did, even down to his handshake. What can I do for you, Mr. Uh... Murphy. Sorry, it's Mr. Murphy. I shook his hand and started inching away from others to be outside of their earshot. Sorry to barge in like this, Chief Inspector. I'm from Aviemore, and I just recently moved here. There was something serious going on there, and I had to move away. There are children disappearing, and I think I know who's involved. He stared at me, dead in the eyes. Well, who is it? You need to understand, this isn't some kind of stupid prank or anything. 
I can take you to a number of sites where they seem to operate from. Okay, I understand that, he said, making me relax a little bit. Have you ever heard of Detective Chief Superintendent Williams? I asked. He shook his head. I have evidence he's been involved in this. I have personally witnessed him doing particularly weird things that could tie him down to these crimes, and he threatened to kill my son if I don't keep silent. I continued. The chief's mouth dropped a little. Also, the head of my son's nursery and some of the staff and doctors and nurses are all involved, I'm sure. Now, I think he has my ex-wife captive, possibly, and she phoned, pleading for me to come and help her. But I need someone with your kind of experience and your manpower to help me. I'm honestly scared to go back. Can you wait here for five minutes? The chief said. Less than five minutes later, he rushed out with a bunch of staff, files, and other pointless articles. He jumped in a police van after loading up his bags and folders. If this is true. We'd better go right away. We'll blue light to the police. I'll head for Abby Moore. You just keep me in the right direction. We'll get to the bottom of this, Mr. Murphy. And if you could just follow behind me. He said to Archie, who was still a little shaken up. Mr. Murphy, would you please come with me? I nodded in agreement, though I questioned Archie's ability to drive given his current state. There's nothing I hate more than an officer sworn to uphold the law, taking advantage of the position, and committing an ungodly sin against our brothers and their communities, McKinnis said as we pulled onto the road. The drive was awkwardly silent most of the way. It was getting dark, and I kept checking in the wing mirror to make sure Archie was keeping up and he hadn't veered off into a ditch. It took about fifty minutes, and we had reached Aviemore. Archie still swerved behind us. I was about to speak when McKenna's took a sharp turn off the road. So, this cabin was up this way? He asked. I looked in the mirror. Archie's lights followed obediently. Um, yeah, up here toward the crossroad. Then it's... Kind of a hairpin turn to the right, I replied. Something wasn't right. We made the turn and I checked the mirror. I saw Archie follow again. So, left here and then just follow this road? McKinnis asked. Um, yeah, just follow it all the way. The trees will start to clear up. Something definitely wasn't right. And I just realized what it was. I never told McKinnis about the cabin. As we rolled ahead, I watched Archie's headlights bouncing along the trail. It had just hit me like a ton of bricks, and he had no idea. My hairs stood on end. I saw McKinnis at the side of my eyes, his menacing look straight forward. I could tell he knew that I knew. This was it. There was nobody we could turn to now. We slowed. The lights of the police van illuminated the cabin just ahead. There were people darted around... People in robes, a couple of small fires, and a large black transit van with a strange red W symbol on the side. There was a lump in my throat. I closed my eyes as we stopped. The Demons of the Lake Some of this entry may be very disturbing. It has been very distressing to me having to reaccount these memories, and I apologize if anyone reading feels as sick as I did writing this experience down. But I had to stick with the truth. The door opened and I was dragged out. I heard Archie getting yanked out of the car too. People were screaming at us to stay down. I felt my face crunch as a large boot connected with a swift kick I never saw coming. I was face down in the mud. I felt numerous kicks and punches all over my body. I retched all over. It felt like the beating lasted for hours. I honestly thought they would beat us to death right there. Bloodied and bruised, we were dragged into the cabin. Into one of the rooms. It could have been the bedroom I saw before. It smelled like shit and death. There were four heavily soiled mattresses in the room, with a number of shackles cemented into the wall over each one. Our hands were shackled, and we were forced to lie in one of the rancid beds. For days, we were starved, beaten regularly. Sometimes people would come in and piss on us, piss on our wounds. I have never felt so ashamed in my life. This had us at a breaking point already, and things were only just beginning. 
I begged and pleaded for them to kill me every time someone would enter the room. They had a doctor come in, cloaked and hooded to check on us, make sure we don't die. We were given just enough treatment and care to force us to live this hell against our will. What made things worse was whenever Archie fell asleep. I envied him so much. I hadn't slept in three or four days, and sleeping seemed like the only escape, the only release. But no matter how much I tried, it would never come. Twenty-four hours a day of pure suffering. The chronology of events here is rather hazy, so I will describe certain events as best I can. But some of them may have taken place before or after others. I will describe them as I remember. One of the days Williams took me outside, he wanted to talk to me. Although, not much talking took place. He made me walk on smoldering logs and coals from the burn pits. He said it was to brace me for the fires of hell, bearing in mind I had almost zero strength in my legs. It took me several seconds to take the four steps required to clear a pit. By the end, I had giant blisters and almost no skin on my feet. I was then made to walk through the mud back to the cabin. Before we got there, he laughed and stopped me. Oh, I almost forgot. You remember this? He chuckled, pointing to the black transit van. I stared at the van, then him, and nodded slightly, wondering why he was asking. I knew you were trying to see in the back window. You want to see what's in there? I really didn't, but of course he drags me over anyway. Check this out, he said in a proud manner as the door swung open. It chilled me to the bone, the fact he was driving this thing around and nobody could do anything about it. It disgusted me to my core. I retched, but I had nothing to vomit up. The van also smelled like shit and death. There were three tiny mattresses also with chains, but the really disturbing thing was the dirty, soiled baby's crib, which also had tiny shackles on it. I had to look away. Then, he dropped a bombshell on me, one which made me suffer more than any pain I was currently experiencing. Julian was right in this van at the nursery when you were there. You were within three feet of him, and you didn't even fucking know it. He broke into a huge fit of laughter and slapped me on the face so hard I could feel it throbbing. I broke down as he dragged me by my feet back to the room and chained me up again. On another day, we were dragged to the Red Hall. Beautiful choral voices sang hymns to an unknown god. They would drink from a large chalice and talk about blood sacrifice while in some sort of prayer. We were made to watch. These sermons, if you could call it that, or, or rituals, would happen almost daily. We would be made to watch animals being slaughtered, although one of the times they had a delirious drugged man. They cut him open and began to pull out his organs and bite into them as if they were bobbing for apples. We were brought here a number of times and we were always made to watch. Sometimes they would stick red-hot pokers into our skin and inhale the smoke that rose from our flesh. I'm not entirely sure when this happened. It could have been the day when Williams showed me the van, which makes sense, but it doesn't link up in my head. Archie and I were lying, trying to speak to one another. Williams came in. He just stood, watching us probably trying to think of other torture methods. We lay in silence. He spoke up. One day, Cameron, soon, he'll have the privilege of dining with the devil himself. Ah, oh, like father, like son. He began laughing again like a maniac, staring at me wide-eyed and nodding as if I was supposed to know what that meant or find it funny. But what the fuck do you mean? I spoke back through gritted, broken teeth. Oops. Didn't you know? I shouldn't have said anything. Silly me. He gave a sarcastic chuckle. Your very own son, Julian, had a once-in-a-lifetime dinner with the devil. Lucky little man. I never got to witness the Lord in all his glory until I was in my forties. Maybe fifties, actually. He stared wide-eyed at me, 
dying for me to ask the question. What do you mean? I don't understand. Is Julian here? Is he alive? I sat, confused and worried. He laughed again. He walked over and stuck his boot in my throat and gradually increased the pressure. He laughed even more wildly now, seeing the fear in my eyes. No, he's not here. Excuse me. I must rephrase what I said. When I said he dined with the devil, I actually meant he was dined on by the devil. He burst out laughing, like a madman again, as if it was hilarious in some way. His foots never released me. I won't give you all the gory details, not yet anyway. Let me just tell you, he was delicious. We cut him into pieces and ate every single bit of him the very same night he went missing. We even boiled his bones to make a beautiful gravy stock. A good chef never wastes a thing. He winked at me, and with a sudden increase of force on my neck, he let go and kicked me in the gut. Sweet dreams, boy, he said, as he whistled and walked casually out the door. I lay there, terrified, thinking of my son's last moments, how scared and alone he must have been, wanting his dad to save him, and I couldn't even do that. I hated myself. I just wished I was dead. One of the last days Williams entered the room, he was excited. He kept dancing around and talking about how it was almost time and he couldn't wait. We had just finished a savage beating. We both had next to no teeth left. Archie got it slightly worse than me, I thought. His eyes were closed over swollen. Actually, his whole face was swollen. He hadn't eaten in almost a week, and he would just lie there, not making a sound while they beat the fucking hell out of him. His body and mind had given up. This day, Williams was in a good mood for some reason. He pointed one finger out, and alternately pointed to each of us and sang, Eeny, meeny, miny, ma. It's Archie's turn to be let go. His finger landed on Archie with the word, go. I couldn't even say how confused I was at this. What did he mean? He picked Archie up like a bag of potatoes and stood him in the doorway. I'm gonna miss you, Archie boy, but it's time you were set free. You don't look too good. It's the blood moon tonight and I'm in good spirits, you know. I'm feeling generous, he said smiling between both of us like some kind of lunatic. Archie's legs wobbled. I couldn't really make out his face. It looked like he was smiling. I'm hoping he was smiling. That's it, Archie boy. You can do it. Stand up tall, son. He whispered as he began to release his arm from Archie's waist, which was steadying him. You gonna say goodbye to your friend Cammy here sometime today, please? He shouted beside Archie's face. Archie struggled to lift his head and arm. He made an attempt at a wave and a somber grunt, which I expect was him saying goodbye. Oh, one last thing, Archie. Williams put his arm around his shoulders and leaned in. He whispered so quietly, but loud enough so I could hear too. I killed Ben. With that last word, he raised his other hand and plunged a blade into the side of Archie's neck and threw him with great force onto the floor beside me. Claret consumes the floor as the blood decanted from Archie's jugular. He barely even moved. He didn't try to resist. He just gargled blood until his eventual end. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. I just cried more. By the time I looked up, Williams had already gone. He left me sitting with Archie's dead body all day and night. His clotting blood was all over the floor, all over my mattress, some on my legs. His lifeless body just dumped like a piece of rubbish. It still looked like he had a smile. He was released. He was released from this hell, and he didn't have to suffer anymore. That was the only comfort I could take from it.
That night I lay there, awake as usual. Archie lying in front of me stiff as a board, coagulated blood marbled the floor. I felt sick and exhausted, boots marching along the hallway to the door. It sounded like an army. The door opened. Seven hooded figures stood before me in the hall, the light dashing in like a halo above their heads. It's time, one of them said. It didn't sound like Williams. It was possibly McInnes, but I wasn't sure. Not that it mattered. I was unshackled and dragged to my feet. There was still a lack of skin on my soles, yet I was made to walk the whole way. My bones felt fractured, my stomach empty. My head was pounding. I'm sure I had infections of some kind, possibly everywhere. My breathing was shallow and painful. As we walked, they chanted in whispers. A language I had no way of understanding. The one at the front held a staff with a star and a cross type insignia on top. The choral voices rang from the end of the hallway in the blood red hall. The double door was closed. The red slit of light emanating from the middle of the doors made them look like a large serpentine eye. The doors opened as if by magic. As we got within two steps, the choral singing got quieter. Whispered mantras and muttering filled the hall as we walked down the center aisle. There were easily sixty or seventy people seated. Maybe ten stood on either side of the altar. I was taken forward to where a table lay. I was hoisted up and shackled in. My wrists and ankles burned as they were tightened. A hooded man made his way to the altar and spoke. Brothers, sisters, we are gathered on this night to fulfill our duty to our lord. The witching hour is looming, the blood moon above. Take this gift of blood. We offer thee with love. The man cut my palm and blood rushed into a small chalice. Once full, they placed it on the center of a pedestal. The seven stepped forward and drank. They pulled their hoods back. I saw before me, my doctor. He made me wonder about the painkillers I was prescribed and the detrimental effects they had on my entire body. A man who I was unfamiliar with, but recognized as a teacher from the school who had plans to put Julian in that year. Carolyn, the owner of Julian's nursery. DCS Williams. Chief Inspector McInnes. As I made my way around the faces, drinking my spilled blood, I could not believe who I saw. Next was Archie's mom. She drank and smiled a toothy, bloody grin at me. At last, the hood fell back. I died another death. Linda. Linda took the last sip. My head fell back, and I cried with dry eyes. There was nothing in me to make tears anymore. Why did you do it? How could you have done this to our son? I whimpered, barely audible. Yes, I was a coward, and I should have screamed and shouted and cursed them all, but what was the point? They didn't care. I was a dead man anyway. The hall fell silent. An eighth hooded figure stepped forward, seemingly out of nowhere. It's time. A low, growling voice spoke. He is ready for the ritual under the stars. If accepted, he will be taken to the lake to be judged. The voice continued. It seemed to come from above or below. It came from everywhere. I could feel myself being drawn to the blackness under the hood. With more whispering mantras and chanting, I was carried by the eight of their shoulders, exposing my naked, bruised body to the deep chasm of space above. The stars looked different tonight, like they had rearranged in a way that was scrutinizing my every thought and emotion. I was an empty vessel. I could see the green clearing just ahead. There was a large fire and people dancing around it, throwing things in, making it spit and dance higher than ever. I was placed on a bed of stone, looking to the sky. The clearing fell silent as the hooded figures gathered around my body, they whispered evil-sounding words in that weird language. 
They held ceremonial blades and staffs, all with the cross and star insignia and the W symbol I had seen so many times now. The dark, shrouded eighth figure led the proceedings. He would chant something. The fire would rise, and the others would whisper and refrain in unison. I lay there, waiting to die, watching the stars, wondering what it was like out there. If, when I die, will the secrets of the universe be known to me? Will there be an afterlife, or would everything just cease to be forever? The fire raged on, and I thought I could see the stars moving, aligning themselves. Black candles that circled me lit at once, as if by some kind of sorcery. He is present. He is among us. The eighth man growled in a hushed tone. Our minds are aligned. We bring forth a mortal soul for your judgment. Lord below the cross, Lord of the mantle, bringer of wrath and destruction. Please accept this offering. We bow down to your almighty power. The crowd made a whispered refrain. Let him be judged, over and over. There were drums beating to a crescendo. The candles went out in a flash, and the fire dimmed. I don't know what exactly this meant, but they soon told me it meant my soul had been accepted, and I was to be taken, to be judged, and some kind of deal was to be made before I'm taken. I just wanted it to be over. The demons of the lake will take you, and you will be judged by the Lord, the leading hooded man said. I was taken to the grassy area and laid near to where I pulled Loretta's body from the water not too long ago, and I was given some gooey black stuff to drink. It was warm and horrible, and I drank it willingly. I wanted all of this to stop, and part of me was just glad to have something in my stomach. Everybody began whispering mantras and kneeling and standing up in some kind of trance. The ground began to heave, the lake began to swell. I saw everything in a moment. I saw the old man's head sticking out of the water. I tasted Loretta's flesh. I saw Julian. I saw Archie's dead eyes. The black, smoky creature consuming the souls of the living. The horrifying white faces circled me. The stars were swooshing around like the candles in a whirlpool. They got bigger, brighter, hotter. The ground got colder and wetter. It felt like feet running across my back. The air was ice in my lungs. My skin blistered, and eyes rolled back, and I could hear the screaming anguish of millions, no, billions of lost souls swirling around me in a sea of complete insanity. I could feel the wrath and the hostility of the far reaches of the universe. And then, all at once, in a split second, it stopped. I was alone. I was warm and healthy and safe. I was in a dark place. I looked at my unbroken fingers. I could feel my teeth in my mouth. I felt no pain, and I was at peace. A dim glow illuminated me as I stood in eternal darkness in a shallow black ocean only about an inch deep. My bare feet felt the black water, lukewarm and slightly oily. I looked around. Was I dead? I heard a splashing up ahead. I called out. Hello? A low, chilling, lion-like growl came from the deep. Two of the deepest blood-red serpent eyes pinged open before me, looking at me, looking into my soul. I could feel them pierce my heart. Hello, Cameron Murphy. A deep voice spoke as a dim light from nowhere illuminated a tall, well-dressed, and well-groomed man, with eyes of the deepest sin. He looked normal, but those eyes haunted me. What can I do for you, my son? He said. I wasn't sure what to say. Uh, am, am I dead? I asked sheepishly. Do you feel dead? He answered with a question. Well, no. To be honest, I feel more alive than I have in a long time, I replied. 
feeling myself for bruises or cuts, not finding one. Then you must be alive, no? He grinned at me. His smile seems to be wider than his face. His eyes would contort and change as he spoke. Well, I don't know. Just minutes ago, I was a bloodied pulp lying on the grass. I sat, trying to avoid his gaze. And look at you now. He chuckled to himself. So you must realize the power I possess. He grinned wide again. I didn't like that. He began circling, his eyes shifty and deceiving. So, if I'm alive, then what is this place? Where am I? I caught his eyes. He seemed to jerk in delight at my question. You should know this place well, my child. We are inside your mind. You are absolutely still alive and breathing, but in here, we are free. We mustn't adhere to the laws of the physical world. He disappeared from the light and reappeared by my ear and whispered. You keep looking away, but do not fear me. If I gave you something to fear, you would be cowering on the floor like a maggot under my thumb. He hissed, his voice sounding snake-like. I turned and fixed my gaze on him. So, are you the devil? Satan? I felt sheepish once more. He began circling me again, slower. That's what they may think out there. Those fools and their whispering. There is no devil. There is no god. I come from a higher plane of existence. I can move through dimensions with the grace of a dolphin in the ocean. I am one of the ancients. I inhabit the beyond and more. I am the one who brings darkness and decay. I can deceive the greatest minds in the universe with a single look. I can bend and shake beings of the lower planes to do my work for me. I am no devil. I am no god. I am just like you. I am doing what I have to, to stay alive. He turned and looked right at me. His eyes glowed a violent red and his voice raised to a roar. He began circling me again like a shark. So, if you're not the god or devil, and you say you're one of the ancients, where are the others? Are there any good ancients? I never took my eyes off of him for a second. What would you define as good? To me, I'm good. But to you, I'm probably evil. There are demonic entities all over this place, all over the universe. The lake is like a portal for them. The glass water reflects the universe in its purest and most ancient form. These demons, they are evil. They are selfish, hostile, and to make rash decisions. I believe you have met a few of them before. I can see it in you. He nodded and smiled at me, confirming what he already knew. But these demons answer to the ancients. They answer to me. And I... I am not so rash. I have the wisdom of a thousand worlds. My decisions are careful and always correct. So, you may call me evil, but you have witnessed pure evil with your own two eyes. And I can tell you now, you are not looking at evil, my friend. His words confused me a little. He continued to shuffle around me in a circle, holding my gaze. I wasn't even sure if he had answered my question. I spoke up after a minute's silence. So, tell me this. Do you consider eating human children evil? Because that William bastard told me you dined on my son with them. I raised my voice, saying this. I was angry, but still afraid, although it made me feel brave. I don't call it evil. I call it survival. They offer sacrifices in return for wealth and prosperity. He grinned wide once again. But he was my son. He wasn't theirs to offer. I didn't cower this time. I stood my ground. On the contrary, my child. The boy's blood mother offered him up to me willingly. Do not worry. 
Julian did not die in vain. He suffers no more. His voice was calm and protective. I felt like he was lying to me. He was my child, too. I didn't want him to be offered as a sacrifice. I wanted him to live his life. And you, she, stole that from me. My tone was in anger once more. The thought of what Linda did filled me with hate. Of course, you are absolutely right. And I owe you a debt. Which is why I asked you when you got here. What can I do for you? His horrible smile flashed out with the width of his face. You may ask of me one thing, but do not forget. I have been promised your soul and your essence, and I always collect. I just want Williams dead. I want them all dead, but mostly him. I spoke, staring at the ground and shaking my head, thinking of everything he had done to us. I sense great emotion in your hatred. And I like it. He hissed in my ear again. Consider it done. And with that, he snapped his fingers. DCS Williams appeared before me. He saw the Ancient and dropped to his knees. I am not worthy. I am not worthy. He cried on his hands and knees. Get up. The Ancient scalded with venom. Williams looked panic-stricken. The Ancient snapped his fingers once more, and with the most blood-curdling howl of pain I had ever witnessed, he was reduced to ash, dissolving in the black water beneath us. I looked on in awe. Is he... is he really... really dead? I stammered. That is what he wanted, is it not? He replied. I mean, well, yes, but wasn't he like your friend or, I don't know, an ally or something? I mean, he worked for you, right? I asked, still unsure if that had just happened. He brought gifts. I brought payment. It's merely transactional. I do not care for his idolatry. He loves and adores me unconditionally. Therefore, he is at my mercy. There will always be others to do my work. In this life, there are deal-makers and deal-breakers. The deal-makers will receive handsome rewards. Those who break a deal are usually not shown the same mercy as your friend Williams. There are places worse than your minds to be lost in, you know? Places even I fear. His soft voice echoed as he spoke in a low, calming note. He went silent for a moment and stopped walking. I kept my eye on him at all times. His smile widened again. His glowing snake eyes met mine. Oh, you enjoyed that, didn't you? I can feel it. You were full of hatred and anger. You even hate me. His smile grew even wider, and I'm sure he got about a foot taller. That's the energy of the universe filling your body and mind with absolute vile hatred for your fellow man. You enjoyed watching him burn into nothing, and I felt it from your emotions. You wanted that to happen to me too. He looked shocked and overly excited now. Why, this is such a pure form of the most beautiful energy, the likes of which I have not seen for millennia. You will go far in my world, my son. I looked straight at him. You said you're a deal maker. Then how about this for a deal? You return me to my body, and I'll provide you with six more souls by the end of the week. I said, as I felt like I had just come up with the best plan ever. That does sound tempting. I don't necessarily feel like the whisperers in the woods know very much about how these things work. But he will be giving me six souls. Is that all you ask in return? He spoke softly, stopped, and looked me dead in the eyes. Yes, I only want to live, and I want a chance to kill every last one of them myself. I snarled back at him, staring right back in his eyes of molten metal. Good. He laughed. The malice is pure. The hatred is strong. You will get your chance, my child. But know this. 
Those who break the deal will be shown no mercy. I can be as evil as I can be kind, but we don't have a week. If you fail to deliver me six souls by dawn of the next day, you will spend an eternity lost in a never-ending maze of fear and suffering. Believe my words. I may deceive the pure of heart, but I do not lie when bordering. I believed him, and I was ready to make things right. I was hungrier than ever. My eyes opened, and a deep, icy breath filled my lungs. The six remaining hooded figures picked me up and carried me to the cabin. There was no one else in sight. Dawn was minutes away, and the sky was a pale purple and red to the east, a deep blue to the west. The paintbrush of the universe was something to behold. I was placed on a mattress that was clean, and I was told when Williams disappeared, a voice spoke to the rest of them, telling them to take me back and heal my wounds. They had all obediently agreed. I'm still sore right now, but my strength is definitely back. I have had food, I have had water, pain relief, cream and ointments on my cut. My every whim has been tended to. These people are treating me like some kind of prophet. I have died, and I have risen, and they have no idea what I have planned. This has been my log of events until today. Like I said, if I don't make it, do not try and find me, for your own sake, and do not come to Aviemore. If I do, hopefully I can live to write another page. I want to live to tell my story to the world. But as for now, the sun has risen, and I have 24 hours to kill all six of them, and not a fucking drop of blood will go to waste. Wish me luck. A done deal. This will probably be my final entry. So, after my log, for those of you who read it, I said I hoped to make it out alive to fill you in on what exactly happened. Well, I'm alive. I'm here. But things didn't quite go exactly as I had planned. It's taken some days for me to get in the right mental state to begin writing this, but I am alive, so I'm not complaining. Let me take you through that last day. It began when I was carried back to the cabin. The six hooded figures I assumed were still Linda, Carolyn, McKennis, that teacher guy. I didn't know his name yet, though I found out his name was Kenneth Lang, Archie's mom, and my GP, who was actually named Dr. Phillips. I'm not sure of his first name. In fact, I didn't get his first name. I probably should have. Anyway, it didn't matter to me. Fuck him. I was in a comfortable bed. The doctor was giving me antibiotics and painkillers that didn't make me want to die. I was fed a great breakfast. I honestly must have drank about 40 liters of water, and my cracked lips were so grateful for the moisture. My body still throbbed with most movements, but I was mobile, and I felt my strength returning rapidly. They would come in periodically asking what Satan had said to me, asking for his prophecies and wisdom, asking me what happens to Williams, why was he chosen instead of me. I reiterate the same answer every time. We must wait until sundown, the seven of us, and only us. We'll gather by the lake, and we will speak to our Lord. There is a great day of judgment coming. Or something to that effect. All bullshit, of course. They fucking lapped it up like obedient little puppies. I just had to figure out how I was going to kill all six of them without retaliation, without the other five killing me instantly after I killed the first one. I also wanted to find out as much as possible who else may be involved, who was the leader, or were there any higher-ups other than them? Were there any people in higher positions of power involved, politicians, or... I don't know. I just wanted as much information as possible. About 10 a.m., most of them had left for their various jobs. The doctor was told to stay, and Linda also stayed behind. She came into my room. I was dying to kill her immediately. I couldn't wait to cut her throat, or strangle her, or rip her guts out. Whatever I was going to do, it would never be enough to satisfy my lust for her blood, but it would be a start. I just could not fathom how things came to be like this. How could she do this to her own son? Her face, her very existence, made me feel sick to my stomach. 
She sat on the end of the bed and started washing my feet and legs. The blistering and skinned soles burned, but then some incredibly soothing cream was lathered on and made it fade away until it was just about bearable. She was humming a tune I recognized. It was a song we used to sing to Julian when he was going to bed. A tear rolled down her cheek and stopped at her chin. She had done the most unthinkable thing any human could do. But I could see she was still hurting inside from the laws. There was a hint of genuine emotion, and I figured I could probably use this to my advantage. Linda, I said softly. Her eyes peered over in my direction without moving her head. They were red and damp. He told me Julian isn't suffering, I continued, as she sat silently and still. She looked away, and I could see she was definitely crying now. I hate that he isn't here anymore, but I'm glad he's not suffering wherever he is. I hate to think of what happened to him, but... I stopped. I had to prepare myself for what I was about to say. He is with the Lord now, and he's watching over him. I detested the words that had just come out of my mouth. She burst into a fit of tears. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. She kept repeating over and over while sobbing uncontrollably. There are some things we need to discuss before tonight. I've been asked to share certain details with you and only you. I told her after about eight minutes of her crying. You see... Not everyone is to be chosen to deliver the Lord's word. We will be smaller in numbers when the night is through. She looked puzzled by this, but thankfully not suspicious. Who is to be chosen, then? She asked, her voice still trembling a little. That will become apparent later. Even I'm not 100% sure. But you and I, we've definitely been chosen. It's part of my deal. I wanted you saved. As for the rest, the Lord will choose wisely and true, and we will uphold his demands, no matter what. I nodded, seeking her approval, hoping she didn't suspect anything. She smiled at me, eyes welling up once more. Thank you, Cameron, she said, as her words began to wobble slightly. She stood up and blew her nose, turned and smiled at me again. I smiled back, and she left the room. As soon as I heard her footsteps disappear, I took a deep, deep breath. I retched. I felt sick, horrible, guilty. I wished I could have just stuck a bullet between her eyes, but I would play it out, do my best not to lose it, and do what I came back to do. A couple of hours later, the doctor was shouting something in the hallway at Linda. It was evidence that he wasn't happy about Williams being taken in my place. I listened closely to the muffled shouting. He shouldn't be alive. This doesn't make sense. Why would he be back? Williams was our prophet in the north, not this fucking clown. He was pacing on the annoyingly loud wooden floor. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. He was chosen. He has spoken directly with the Lord, and Williams is gone. It's as simple as that. Linda yelled back, defending me. You're only saying that because you never wanted him dead in the first place, stupid fucking slut. Get out of my face. He screamed at her. He must have shoved her out of the way because I heard what sounded like Linda falling to the ground. We should have killed you. He shouted from further away, just before a door slammed shut. Linda came back into the room. What was all that shouting about? I asked, pretending not to have heard what they said. It was nothing. She smiled. Just a disagreement about something. That's all. She sat on the bed again as she spoke. Linda, I need you to tell me something. There are things I need to know about the Whisperers. I sat up and placed my hand on her shoulder. She felt cold to the touch. I continued. How big is this? I mean, are there more of us around the country or anywhere else? I asked. She looked down. There are chapters all over Britain. She said in a hushed voice. 
but most of them come here for the larger masses or the main rituals. Something to do with the lake. It's either here or there's another main down in the East Midlands somewhere. But we've never been. She glanced at the door. Okay, so obviously there's police and high up people involved in this. I mean, McKinnis. What the fuck is that? Is anyone else that high up? How can this all stay so under the radar? I hoped I wasn't asking too much. I didn't want any suspicions drawn on me. She waited for a few seconds, glancing at the door again. There's supposed to be some judges, and also some MPs, but I don't think it goes as high as any top officials in Parliament or the royal family or anything. I think it's just enough so there's nothing that gets out, she replied, still keeping herself quiet. Why? she asked, looking confused. Because I... I had to think of some excuse for asking these questions. Because I'm a prophet, and I have to spread his word, and I don't even know where to begin. I just need to know where to start. I don't know anything about these people. Oh. She looked once more at the door. There were footsteps in the hallway, but they were not approaching. So, why was I chosen to be sacrificed? I asked, feeling naive. She looked in my eyes, and I could see the sadness in her. I never wanted it, Cameron. Honestly, I never wanted them to hurt you. But they kept saying you and Archie had seen too much and were getting too involved. I swear I never wanted them to hurt you. She started whimpering. I still love you, Cameron. She flung her arms around me. I reciprocated. To be honest, despite everything, I genuinely felt her pain and misery. And part of me still loved her. I actually felt bad for her at that moment. My feelings of hate for her had begun to wane. She was vulnerable. She probably didn't want any of this. She was hurting, and so was I. And in this moment, right now, all we actually had left in the world was each other. Her embrace was comforting, and I felt her heart beating against mine. I missed her. I missed her touch, her smell. I never wanted us to be apart in the first place, and now... I don't want us to be apart again. I hushed my own voice this time. Linda, I said in her ear, I don't want to have to tell you this, but I have no choice. She sat back, hands on my shoulders, and her beautiful jade green eyes glared into mine. You need to listen very carefully. This is serious. I continued, holding her gaze. We need to kill the other five, and we need to kill them tonight, by the lake, before the sun comes up. It's the only way we can get out of here alive. I made a deal. Six souls to save us. He already took Williams, and we need to kill the other five before tomorrow. My voice trembled. Talking about it made me nervous. I had never killed anyone before. She looked scared. She looked round at the door again. Cameron... This is fucking insane. We can't... We can't do that. Why can't we just get five other people? McKenna's can bring in drifters, or... Or homeless people, or... She trailed off. Linda, it has to be them. It was a deal. It has to be them. Nobody else. We do this, and we live. And we can forget about all of this. Go back to our lives. Maybe even have another baby. My eyes began filling up. As did hers. I don't know, Cameron. How would we even do that? There's five of them. I don't know. This seems too risky. Listen, Linda. We have to. Otherwise, it'll be us. And trust me, you don't want to see the things I've seen. It's us, or them. And I don't fucking want to lose you again. I love you too. I pulled her in and kissed her soft, pink lips. She was shaking. Okay. Okay. But we need to figure this out. This can't go wrong in any way. They're fucking ruthless, and they will kill us without a second thought if they have any inkling that we're up to something. Don't worry. We'll make sure we get this done. For us. I said, calmly. For us. She repeated, and kissed me once more. Memories of better days filled my head. I felt like I was floating when we kissed. She stood up and left the room without saying anything else. I heard a car outside. It sounded like a van. 
Two doors opened and closed, and I could hear voices approaching the cabin. I decided it was time for me to get up, address my people, and begin putting together some kind of plan. It was Archie's mom and McKenna's. They had been away to Inverness together, walking alongside Loch Ness looking for potential souls to be offered up to God. A short walk later, Kenny Lang appeared, followed by Carolyn, who was complaining about being late because some parent was stuck in traffic and couldn't pick up their shit-eating little brats, as she called the poor kid. I wondered if she ever spoke about Julian that way. I spoke to Linda once more. I had a kind of idea I wanted to run by her. We were gathered for a feast before the big night in about half an hour, so I took Linda to my room to have a quick chat. We rushed into the room, avoiding being seen and spoke in low voices. I have an idea, I said. I'll tell everyone at the feast that we're going to the fire in the clearing under the stars, and then we all have to take our robes off and go to the lake completely naked. I'll make something up about burying our bodies and souls to the sky and stars. It means they won't have anything on them. No weapons or anything. Footsteps interrupted us. We held our breath as they quickly got further away. I continued. When we get there, we stab Kenneth and Dr. Phillips first. They're the strongest and most able-bodied. Get it right in the side of the neck. My mind saw Archie at that moment. Blood spewing from a gaping wound as he crashed to the ground. Linda listened intently. This will leave Carolyn, Archie's mom, and McKinnis. Now Archie's mom and McKinnis are the oldest, so we can probably fight them off easier. They probably won't be able to run as fast. Carolyn will be next. You have to get her, exactly the same, while I'll go for McKinnis. After that, depending on where Archie's mom is, we kill her, or look for her and bring her back to the lake. Do not kill her anywhere else. They need to die at the lake. I looked Linda dead in the eyes, nodding. Okay, she said. But if we're all naked, where the fuck do we pull a knife from? She asked, waving her hand out as if to say, where are these magic knives? I was actually pretty stumped. One of us will have to run over, take two of the ceremonial blades and hide them next to something obvious to us, like a certain rock or tree stump. We won't be taking any knives of staffs with us, so they won't notice, I replied just as more footsteps approached, then disappeared towards the Red Hall. By one of us, I mean you, of course. I added. She nodded her head. Okay, I should make it back for the feast if I leave now. We hugged, kissed, said I love you, and quietly exited the room. Linda went to grab two knives, and I waited. She would be twenty minutes, max, and when she returned... I would be headed for the Red Hall, following the whispers again. The dark corridor was unsettling and familiar. The red slit down the crack of the doors seems to stare at me with almighty malice. I took a deep breath, and I opened the door. A whispering din filled the Red Hall. A table was laid, and three hooded figures sat on each side, with a chair at the far end, underneath the Baphomet statue. There was a feast fit for a king waiting. The cooks had obviously been extremely busy. I walked slowly to the head of the table, feeling every eye on me as I moved. I stood in my place and spoke. Brothers and sisters, tonight we will feast in celebration of the coming of our Lord. He has spoken to me, and I have his wisdom and prophecies to pass, only to the six of you. They sat with heads bowed and hands clasped. Once we have eaten, brothers and sisters, we will go to the clearing under the stars. Then we will light a beacon for our lord. We will disrobe, and we shall stand by the lake, bearing our bodies and our souls to the universe above and the universe below. We will be one with the stars. We will be one with the earth. We will be one with time, and we will be one. I paused for dramatic effect. With the lord... I then continued after a silence. He will await us from the lake, and we shall bow to his infallible grace. We have been chosen to carry out his work. This is the message of our Lord. My voice echoed as if I was in a grand church or temple. They refrained in a whisper. Praise our Lord above, 
below and all around, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. Thy bidding will be done in absence of doubt or rumination. The word of the Lord is blessed. We will never cease to adhere to his commands. Bless our Lord. Bless our souls. Bless our house. Bless our meal. With that, everyone threw their hoods back as I sat down, and we ate. Their last supper, and they didn't even know it. With that all out of the way, I was eager to get everyone to the lake. Every other person had left. It was to be us seven, and only us seven. We sat in the red hall in silence. It fell very dark. The large, black candles made wonderful dancing patterns on the red wall. The silence was calming. I was ready. We must go, now, I said in a stern voice. They obeyed, and everyone shrouded their faces again and followed my lead as we headed for the woods. It was almost midnight. We got the fiery pit ready in the clearing. I was still calm and wasn't giving away anything. This had to go perfectly. We lit the fire. It burst into a ten-foot-high pillar of dazzling flame. The heat made me sweat. I addressed the other six once again. Gather around. Join hands, brothers and sisters. We light this as a beacon to our Lord, the Lord of the skies above and the mantle below. Flawless and unfailing is your wisdom. We summon you to bring us your darkest of prophecies. We are ready to serve you and carry out your will. I roared in a growling voice that hurt my throat a bit. The others were throwing their hands in the air and chanting some evil-sounding words I hadn't learned. Then they were beating the ground and grabbing fistfuls of soil from the earth and spreading it around, throwing some pieces into the fire. The fire spit and crackled and spewed licks of orange flame that seems to come at you like a snake's tongue. It roared and got higher and higher. Then, in a second, flashed down to the ground and disappeared, leaving black, glowing embers, pulsing a deep orange in the breeze. Take off your robes, I commanded. We go to the lake, now. He has come. Everybody began undressing. Even our socks and shoes, Dr. Phillips asked. Everything, I snarled back. We are to bear our very souls to the deep chasm above. The lake is a portal, and we must show the Lord our purest form for him to come through. Lay your robes on the ground over here. I placed mine on the grass near the fire. Everybody followed suit. Feel the earth in your feet as we walk. Feel the wind on your body. We must be one with the elements, I said as we began walking towards the lake. I was in front. Linda had already told me the knives were next to an oblong rock right on the bank edge of the water, next to where we were last time. She said she had cleared the other nearby rocks, and this was the only one. You can't miss it, she whispered to me just before the last supper. She was right. You couldn't miss it, and it looked so out of place. I was worried for some reason. It's just a rock, but... Where it was just didn't feel real to me. And if it didn't feel real to me, what were the others thinking? We stopped. The six lined up, left to right. We had Archie's mom, McInnes, Carolyn, Kenneth, Linda, and Dr. Phillips. They faced the lake, heads still shrouded in the thick black robes. Everyone get on your knees to show him that you are at his mercy, that you are not worthy. I stepped towards the lake. The rock was just feet away from me. I could see a glint of moonlight bound off the blade. She had done it, and I was filled with relief. I turned to the lake and stared at the sky in the glassy water surface, undisturbed and as beautiful as ever. I turned back rounds to them. He is coming, I said. Avert your eyes. They are not worthy of his image yet. Everybody looked straight down right away. No questions were asked. We heard a rumble from deep below. The earth seems to quiver in delight. With everyone's head bowed, I carefully picked up the knives. I walked quietly back to join and dropped a knife behind Linda as she whispered some mantra. I stood at the end next to Dr. Phillips. Everyone was in a trance-like state, whispering gradually louder. I leaned over and tapped Linda's back. She looked up, looked at me and nodded. 
In a split second, we had both plunged a six or seven inch blade into the necks of Phillips and Kenny. They hit the ground almost immediately, spewing and gargling what seemed like liters of blood. The other three looked up. In a second, they were bounding for us. Carolyn was closest, but Linda couldn't get the blade out from Kenneth's neck. She made a frantic jab for Linda's hair and missed by about the length of a finger. Linda shot back to evade Carol's advance. I quickly ripped the blade from the doctor's neck and dived with my whole body onto the hard bank to try and grab her. I missed, but she was still pursuing Linda. I got back to my feet and sprinted as fast as I could. I rugby tackled her to the ground, yanked her short hair back to expose her neck, and I ran the blade across it. It zipped open like a wide mouth and began gushing with blood. I got to my feet and stamped on the back of her head, mashing her face right into the damp, bloody soil. I looked up. I saw Linda staring back at me. She had started to run back over, shouting, Behind you! She screamed multiple times. When I finally made out what she said, I turned quickly, and McKinnis was coming at me with Linda's knife. I stuck my leg up and kicked his stomach just as he got to me. He was winded, but never stopped. I crawled backwards to give me some room, but the old bastard was still advancing. I managed to get to my feet. He ran at me with the knife, and I tried to grab him and throw him down. He stabbed my arm, not deep, but it hurt. The blade fell out of my hand. I felt panicked. McKinnis socked me right in the nose, and I fell. He walked over and stuck his foot on my face. You ever wonder what it feels like to be gutted like a fucking fish? He hissed in a demonic-sounding voice. His eyes were wide and maniacal. He raised the ceremonial blade. Then... His eyes went off into the distance. A thousand-yard stare of someone who was suffering extreme body shock. His eyes looked glazed and lifeless. He fell to the ground. My knife was sticking out of the back of his head. Linda stood over him. She was hysterical, panicking, covered in blood. I had no time to comfort her. We had to get Archie's mom. I shook her by the shoulders. Linda, it's almost over. Where did Archie's mom go? She pointed to the woods with a shaky finger. I turned and sprinted to the woods, leaving Linda behind. I didn't get in very far when I heard a groaning sound. I slowed myself down, eyes peeled looking for any movement. I heard it again. I followed the source of the sound and I stumbled over Archie's mom. She had tried to run through the thick woods, fell, and her ankle bone was sticking out of her leg. I have no idea how she'd done it, but it saved me a fuckload of bother. I dragged her back to the lake. Just fucking kill me, she said in an old witch-sounding voice. Oh, don't worry. I'll fucking kill you. You let them kill your only child, my best friend, and for what? I've seen where you're headed. You'll realize it was all for fucking nothing. I was getting more fueled by anger because she smiled and looked smug the whole time I spoke. But I had had enough. I brought the blade down on the front of her neck and it went all the way through to the earth below. I then pulled it out the side, ripping half her throat out. She never made a single sound. I sat down on the grass. It was cold. Linda sat next to me. What do we do now? She asked. We leave them here, I think. He said he would collect them. After this, we're burning their robes burning that cabin down, and we're going to go home and start our new life, start all over again. I threw my arms around her, and we kissed for a long time. A new wave of calm had come over me. We headed back to the clearing. The robes lay in a pile next to the still smoldering pit. I lit the fire again, and I went to pick them up. I took my own first. Linda stood by the fire, grateful for the heat as was I. I stood there with my robe in my hands. The flames waltzed before me. The fire felt good. It was so graceful in the way it moved. I looked at Linda. It lit up her face in such a beautiful way. I really did love her. Come here, I said with a smile. She walked over and smiled back, and I put my arm over her shoulder. She rested her head on mine 
and watched the fire. It felt perfect. She jolted. Her eyes went wide with fear as she slowly moved away from me. The blade I had hidden in my robe slid slowly out from her stomach. She fell to her knees, whimpering, sobbing in pain, alone, scared, knowing she was about to die, and nobody could help her. It's about the same as I expected Julian's last moments were. I was filled with adrenaline looking into her eyes as she wondered why I was doing this to her. I just smiled. I never even spoke. I could tell she knew what was coming now. She cried and threw her head back. I slashed her throat with such force it fell wide open. Blood flew and crackled on the fire. She fell backwards, her lungs gasping for any air it could get, her body twitching. I dragged her to the lake, and I left the six bodies next to each other on the bank, ready to be taken by him. I went back to put the fire out. I did decide to burn all the robes first, though. I threw them on one by one. McKinnis, Carolyn, Kenneth, Archie's mom, Dr. Phillips, and lastly, Linda's. I lifted it to my face to get one last whiff of her scent before I was done. She was gone after that. I held it to my nose. That sweet, fruity stuff she always wore for years brought back so many memories. Memories I can now forget. Something hit my foot. I moved the robe from my face to discover something had fallen from it. That fucking bitch, I said to myself. It was another knife. She had hidden one in her robe, and I can only assume it was there for one reason. She was going to fucking kill me. Well, I got there first. I spat on the robe and chucked it into the fire. It was fucking freezing walking back to the cabin. I couldn't wait to get back and burn that place to the ground. I went inside, straight to my room, and lay down. I had to shower and get all the blood and muck off of me. I had to eat, and then I would burn it down. Take one of the cars back to Aviemore, pack my stuff, and get the fuck away from that place. But before all of that, I needed to lie down. The bed was so comfortable and warm. I lay looking at the ceiling. A wave of satisfaction fell on me. I could finally relax and possibly sleep. It was about 2 a.m., I closed my eyes and sleep finally came to me. Sweet, blissful sleep. My eyes opened slowly, feeling refreshed and reinvigorated. Finally, finally I had slept. I checked the clock. 3.20 a.m. I was a little bit pissed, but sleep was sleep, and I felt great for it. I got up and flicked the shower on, the amazing warm water turning more red as it ran down my body. The shower was covered in blood, so much dirt came out of my hair. The hot water seems to relax every muscle, ease every pain I had. When I got out, I grabbed some clothes and got dressed. I did wonder what had happened at the lake after I left. I wandered around the cabin. It was actually pretty large. I rounded a corner on the opposite side from where my current room was. The smell was like a brick wall. Sick and disgusting. Vile, putrid air filled my lungs. I choked. I walked down to find the source. I recognized a door. It was the room we were kept in. It was open. I walked slowly, trying to make no sound, even though the place was empty. I was simply prolonging the time I didn't have to see where that smell was coming from. I peered into the room. Archie's body was still lying there. I felt sick. The heating in that room had been left on. He was lying in the exact same spot, covered in flies. I shut the door. I would just leave him. He would hopefully be cremated with the cabin, then maybe I would place some kind of memorial for him in this spot. I don't know. I just didn't want to move him. I hurried away from the hallway and walked around to the kitchen to check for food. 
I opened one of the massive fridges. There were loads. I had lots of cheese. I had fruits and cakes, sandwiches, loads of stuff. I thought about the families destroyed as I wandered the halls. Archie had nobody. He only had his mom left. A family completely wiped from existence. I had no family. My son was gone. Linda was gone. I was the last remaining in my family. I don't know everyone else's situation, but it's a lot of destruction for one stupid cause. I stopped in the hallway to the red hall. The red slit of light in the doors regarded me. The huge serpent eye which shouldn't have been there. Everything was supposed to be off. The candles were blown out. I opened the door. A hooded figure sat before the Baphomet statue, facing away from me. I cautiously approached. They turned to face me and stood up. Their presence stirred something in me. A fear. A memory. I felt like I was being drawn into the deepest blackness under the hood. I knew who this was. It was the eighth figure who led the ritual during the Blood Moon. How could I forget about him? I stepped back, thinking of where I could run and grab a knife or something from. He spoke in a low growl. Do not bother running, Cameron. You have done exceptionally well tonight. The voice cast my mind back to being beaten and laid on stones waiting to die. He stepped forward. A gloved hand was raised and lifted the shroud back. It was him. The Ancient. Slight relief overcame me, but I still didn't know what he was doing here. You did well to deliver your end of the bargain, but you cannot burn this place down. We will need it. He growled, getting closer. He seemed taller than before. Need it for what? I asked. What would you give for a good night's sleep? He smiled wide. I don't want any more deals, I said, without any hesitation. He laughed to himself. This will be the deal of a lifetime. All you have to do is forget about burning this cabin down, and I will let you sleep for twelve hours. His smile went beyond his face. I think he got taller again, and his toothy grin was corrupting my mind. If all I have to do was not burn a cabin down, then it's not like I'm killing anyone. All I have to do is literally forget this place exists and I can have that sleep. Something I've wanted for years. I can't even remember the last time I slept more than a couple of hours. In fact, besides a couple of hours ago, I can't even remember the last time I slept. My mind was weak and exhausted. And I accept it. My eyes went hazy. I stumbled to the bed and I fell asleep before my head hit the pillow. Amazing, comfortable sleep and dreams filled me with absolute bliss. When I woke up, I felt absolutely amazing. I felt healed. I was healed. I could feel teeth in my mouth. I could feel no pain. There were no scars or cuts on my body. He was standing in the corner, staring at me. How was that? He grinned. It was... Perfection, I replied, smiling back. I thought it would be. He laughed and began to approach me. How would you like that every day for a week? I would love it. I've never felt so good. I was ecstatic. One soul, he said. His face turned serious. I didn't know what to say. There was no way I was killing innocent people just to sleep. But then, I needed that sleep again. It was already over, and I wanted more. And his eyes, his deep, red, burning eyes, were powerful and persuasive. You are weak. You will accept. He growled as his eyes flashed with fire. One soul, one weak. And that's it. I yielded to his deception without even thinking about it properly, fueled by my own greed. His smile widened. I felt so ashamed, but a full week of feeling like this, 
How the fuck could I turn that down after what I've been through? I happily shook his scaly hand. The deal was done, and he dissipated into the shadows. Now that he's gone, I can see clearly. I'm alone in this cabin, wondering what to do. I should have never accepted. I have two days left, and I need to find someone. I can't believe I'm doing this. There have been intermittent knocks on the door from various numbers of hooded figures. I haven't let anyone in. Not yet, anyway. Maybe I'll need them at some point. I don't even know what happens after this week. He'll probably make me do it again. And you know as well as I do, I'll probably accept. It just feels so good to finally be able to sleep. Signed, Cameron Murphy.